I started off in mathematics. I have a degree in mathematics, and then I have another degree in statistics. And then my PhD is in quantitative genetics. Where do you go? The University of New England, Armadale, Egbert, with Keith Hammond. I was his number one grad student. First grad student ever. It was a long time ago. And, and, and why did you move to the US? I went in, I moved to the US and back up. Back it up. 1980, 1986. Yeah, 1986. Yeah, 1986. So I went to Texas A&M. Oh yeah, I knew that. And I was there. I was there for about 15 years. With Jim Sanders? Jim Sanders. I was in the office right next door to him. Nice yeah. guy. Yeah, he's a nice we, guy. We drove here 10 days ago to look at the farm. You took him around? Yeah, yeah he's a good guy. He's a smart guy. He and his, his son, that's now his uh, lawyer. Up in oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I haven't been there. I left in, I left end of 1999, so nearly 20 years ago. I left to Texas I to Mizzou. I went to Mizzou. I did a few other things. I did genomic effects, I did a startup company, and then I went from there to... What is Bruce Lowe doing? He's up here. He's in Rockford playing nails. So, so I think he stepped down, yeah. and I don't know whether or not he left the, the, he stepped the company. He stepped down from the department yeah. chair, but he's still, in, he's still in, in California. He was, San Luis Obispo. He was supposed to be the chairman of the sections in the New York Oh, shit, really? I don't know. I don't know if he's okay. One of these meetings of animal science, he told me, okay, please come to us because we have to discuss uh, cloud computer. I went, and he did not show up. Where are you? Oh, I'm a motorbike in, in Alaska. Ah, come on. Ah. <laughs> Bom, vamos para nossa última perna aqui. Let's start the last session. And we have two. It's an honor to receive two, these two speakers that are going now. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Jerry Taylor, he's a mathematician, got a degree in mathematics and a, another degree in statistics, and a PhD in quantitative genetics in Australia, and then moved to Texas A&M, and, and, and then and after that for to Missouri State University. Missouri State? Yeah. Missouri State or University of Missouri? University of Missouri, where he is and he's kind of trying to, to, to pretending that he's retired, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Professor Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Bento. Um, thanks, Bento, and also the organizers of the meeting for inviting me to come down to Brazil again. I've been to Brazil about nine or ten times now, but I've never been to this part of Brazil, so it's always good to come down and meet old friends and meet new friends and have the opportunity to talk a little bit about science. So thank you very much for that opportunity. So I've been given a topic um, that of course I know almost nothing about. So because of that I feel very confident giving this presentation that there's almost nothing that I can say that's wrong or at least if I do say that it's wrong I won't know it until the end and you come and point it out to me. So um, the topic that I was given was identification of disease-causing pathogens and breeding for disease resistance in cattle. And what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about some of the experiences that I've had along the way working in particular with people like Alison Van Eenenham, but the other people that were involved in this bovine respiratory disease cat project in the United States, um, which is now about a 10 year old, nearly a 10-year-old project, and we're still working on it, I'm still working on it, and, and trying to make some, some headway. Um, Let's do that. Let's figure out which one is forward. That's forward. Okay. So just like um, John Cole, um, I used my resource, which is Google, to actually try to figure out um, what is actually known about the economics of, of animal diseases. It was put together by this group that's called the International Federation for Animal Health in 2012. And I read through that thing, and in particular, I focused on the executive summary. And one, right there in the middle of the executive summary was this statement, and I'll translate it for you. We don't know. We have no clue, despite the importance of, of animal health and animal disease to production in the world. We just really don't have the data that will let us understand what the actual real cost is to animal production. So I think we'd all agree that it's large. It's important, it's big, but we actually really don't know what the total cost of, of animal health is. 
And I think it's for a number of different reasons. It's due to the fact that cost structures differ very differently around the world, but it's due to the fact that also a lot of these things are not quite measurable. Um, for example, in, if you're a cattle feeder, and we have a, a friend here that does a, a, a fair amount of, of feeding cattle, they have a lot of animals that actually are subclinically ill that actually go off feed and lose productivity, but they actually hide the fact very well that they're subclinically ill. And so the pen riders that go by and look at those animals don't identify them as being sick animals. So you have this, this loss that occurs simply because we're unable to identify illness when it stares us in the face. But the costs are, are of course, due to the losses of animals, the losses of productivity, the treatments, they're the direct costs. The indirect costs are associated with treatment, potential for loss of markets, and being unable, if you have a foot and mouth outbreak in your cattle population, then being able to market your cattle into certain areas of the world is going to disappear and you've actually got a huge cost that's due to that. Um, and then there's human health, you know, we have diseases like, like brucellosis and leptospirosis um, and tuberculosis that if they're in your animal population, um, then they're also moving back into other populations like elk in the United States and from there they end up uh, getting into humans. When humans kill those elk and, and cut, cut those elk open, you get uh, infections across into humans. We really don't have a good, good idea as to actually the, the cost that's due to zoonoses, diseases moving from animals into humans um, and, and how that impacts cost structures. But we know it's important. Um, despite some successes, progress um, in controlling animal diseases is stifled in many developing areas as a result of weak investments in animal health, lack of capacity and suboptimal governance of food safety. Kind of a big mouthful there, but it's saying basically in the developing world there's not enough money being invested into disease research. I scratched out developing because I think the same thing is true in the developed world. If you look at the amount of money that's invested in the United States in animal diseases, it's very, very small. Um, relative to, I think, the size of the problem. Um, a vital first step towards combating animal disease will be to improve data collection and surveillance methods, phenotyping. So we've had several people talk to us today about the importance of phenotyping. That's what they mean right there. We're not phenotyping, we need to be phenotyping, capturing phenotypes on these animals. And then finally, better infrastructure is required to actually be able to diagnose sick animals. As I said, you know, um, I know that when we feed animals that there are animals that look perfectly healthy in there and yet they're sick, subclinically ill, and that it depresses their productivity. And the reason I know that is that we've done experiments where we've harvested highly efficient animals and inefficient animals out of uh, individually fed pens of 100 animals. We've done it from three different locations, the University of Missouri, University of Illinois, and also at a, a commercial feed, feed yard out in Colorado on the border with Nebraska. And we do RNA-seq. We look at gene expression profiles that differ between high efficient and low efficient animals. And what do we find? So in the wet, muddy parts of the United States, Missouri and Illinois, the genes that we find that are different, but different in their expression between those animals are immune function genes. But those animals weren't sick. We didn't pick them because they were sick. They looked perfectly healthy, but they were subclinically ill. When we look at the data from Colorado, where it's much, much drier, we have much fewer health problems out there, what do we find? Metabolic processes, protein turnover in those animals. Very different genes being responsible for differences in feed efficiency in those two different groups of animals. So what this report did not talk about, and kind of shocked me, um, was, was that let's not forget that there is an opportunity for genetic improvement. You know, if there's genetic variability among animals for their susceptibility to disease, and if we have phenotypes on those individuals that are somehow correlated with the disease measure, the true risk measure, um, and then we can design some sort of breeding program potentially that would allow us to select animals that were less susceptible to disease and make changes within the population. Um, and it's cumulative, you know, everyone that you've seen that's shown genetic progress charts um, 
genetic progress builds upon itself, and unless natural selection is acting against you, there's no cost of maintenance. So once you achieve genetic progress, you don't have to reinvest to keep that genetic progress. Your investment is just about making more genetic progress. Okay, so I know very little about diseases in general. Um, Bento just told you I'm, I have degrees in mathematics, statistics, and in, in quantitative genetics, and I know very little about animal health, but I've done quite a bit of work in this area. And the area that I have done some work in is respiratory disease. So I'm going to focus the rest of my talk and tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing in respiratory disease with the idea that it may be possible to actually make animals less susceptible to the pathogens that cause respiratory disease. And I'll also, of course, be talking about the United States because we've got data in terms of costs and, and the like for respiratory disease. So respiratory disease is cow pneumonia, right? Pneumonia in cows. So it's not only the most important disease in cattle in the United States, it's probably one of the most important diseases in cattle worldwide. Um, the cost in the United States is in the vicinity of $1.4 billion per year. And the losses, uh, Allison told you, we have about 90 million beef cows and about 9 million uh, dairy cows in the United States. So of the 100 million animals that we have in the population, we lose about 1% of them every year due to respiratory disease. So it has a pretty profound impact on, on the population. And interestingly, the, the, the incidence, the prevalence of the disease hasn't changed in about the last 20 years, despite the fact that there's been a lot of work to make new vaccines, better management protocols for the disease. We see actually very little change in the prevalence of the disease in the population. We still see a very large proportion, and, and the estimates sort of differ, but, but if you talk to feedlot people, they'll tell you that as many as 50% of the animals in a feedlot will actually suffer from respiratory disease in, in the feedlot. Um, so we clearly need some different approaches to try to solve this problem. Um, and previous reports by uh, Snowder, Gary Snowder, um, back in 2005, had suggested that the risk of disease or the proportion of animals that were actually um, got ill given that they were exposed to pathogens um, had a heritability of about 48%, so very substantial variability. So that made us think that that's really what we wanted to try to drill in on, looking at different genetic approaches towards that. What causes respiratory disease? Well, pathogens. Pathogens from the bovine respiratory disease complex, and a number of them are, are, are lift, listed up there. Um, and if you read the literature, it'll tell you that it's the combination of stress on the animal, which immunosuppresses the animal, and, oops, damn it, how do I go that, that way? Sorry. Okay, stress induced by things like shipping, and certainly if, if this is your method for shipping your animals to market, you'll induce some stress in those animals. So when you finally get them there to market and mix them with a whole bunch of animals that they've never seen before, it's a bit like when, when you guys and, and me, we all got in on an airplane, right? And there's 400 of us all together on the airplane and we've all come from different parts of the world. Uh, what happens? Well, you're sharing the pathogens that you have in your lungs and in your upper respiratory tract with everybody else on that plane. And if you're not being exposed to them before and if you don't have any antibodies to them, guess what? There's a good chance you're going to end up with respiratory disease of one kind or another. Well, you don't actually need to have a stress, a stressor, to actually induce this. In this project I'm going to tell you about, we've done some challenge experiments. They were done at the University of California where we just take animals that are naive, that haven't been exposed to pathogens. So we look at blood titers and we look to see whether or not they've been exposed to pathogens. And if they've not been exposed to pathogens, we bring them into a pen and we make them sick. We give them big doses of, of pathogen and lo and behold they get very sick and um, they'll die. They'll get well sick enough that they'll actually die. So you don't need to have that stressor, but, but of course, if you immunosuppress an animal, it takes a lower dose of pathogen to actually infect that animal and cause that animal to be sick. So these are the things that commonly you'll see in the literature. So these viruses up here and these bacteria down here that are known to be pathogenic and to result in respiratory disease in cattle. And there are probably 
others that we really don't know about. And so if you're in the position that you have sick animals and you don't know why they're sick and you test them using things like pharyngeal swabs and then you send them to the diagnostic laboratory and they run diagnostics which exist for all of these pathogens and you don't find anything in that sick animal, you might say, well, this animal's sick. It's got a pathogen. I don't know what it is. How would you go about finding that? Well, the way that now this is commonly being handled is via nucleic acid sequencing. And I want to give you an example of this that's actually, I thought, a, a, a pretty fun example. This is something we discovered three or four years ago, right after the, the UMD 3.1 assembly was built. A um, group at the University of Missouri were annotating that, that assembly, and so we generated a whole bunch of new Illumina data, paired end Illumina data, 70x coverage, of the genome of this cow. This is the cow that is the reference cow, okay? It's dominant L101449. So she's the reference cow. So we ended up taking DNA that was extracted from white blood cells or from liver, and we sequenced it to 70X. We aligned it to her genome sequence, her reference sequence, and guess what? 7% of the sequences didn't align to the reference sequence. So this is DNA sequenced from her. We aligned back to her genome sequence, and 7% of the sequences don't align. We did the same thing with RNA data. We had 17 tissues from which RNA was extracted. Uh, we used the stranded protocol, so we knew we were getting full-length transcripts in, the, in these data that were off the correct transcribed um, fragment of, of the genome. And we did the same thing. So we had about 577 million reads we aligned them back to the reference genome, and 6% of them didn't align back to the reference genome. So we said, what the hell's going on? Why do we have all of these reads on the animal that's the reference animal that just won't map back to the reference assembly? So we decided to do something about it, and what we did was took all of those unmapped reads, we built them into contigs, we put them through an assembler, built them into little contigs, they weren't very big. So we ended up with, um, right here, 69,000 contigs on average, pretty small, but some of them were quite large. And down here, the same thing, smaller, because these start off from smaller RNA fragments. And we aligned them to the non-redundant nucleotide database. So that's not the reference assembly. That's basically anybody that's ever sequenced anything that's deposited it at NCBI, it's in that database. And we aligned those sequences. And then we said, what did we find? What's in that, in that sequence data? that we basically wouldn't expect to find in the sequence data. So the first thing that happened was we looked at the, the DNA data, the alignments. The second most common alignment was to a worm called Onchocerca ochengai. Do any of you know what that worm is? Onchocerca ochengai? It's got to be some vets in the audience, right? So you know what this is. So this is, this is a parasite that lives in Africa lives in, the vector is, is snails, and gets into humans, and if it gets into humans, it causes river blindness. So it ends up going up into their eyes, I guess, and, and causes river blindness. Now, what the heck is DNA from Onchocerca ochengai that lives in Africa doing in a cow that lived her whole life in Miles City, Montana? You know, we looked at that and thought, this is pretty crazy. It took us a while to figure out what it was. What caused this problem is that whoever did the assembly for Onkosuka Achengai pulled the worm out of a host. It happened to be a cow. It had been feeding on the blood of the cow. They tried to clean the blood from the cow out of the worm. They sequenced it, constructed an assembly, and it turned out that that assembly was chimeric. It had a whole bunch of cow DNA in the assembly. So the Onkosuka Achengai reference assembly is awful. So we told the authors that they had this problem um, and they, they didn't really want to know about it. But, but we removed that from the data because we said this is not really something that's present within this cow, this dominant cow. This is something that's due to contamination of a reference. But what about the rest? Well, if you look at the rest, about eight of the ten top hits are all vertebrates. So including Bos Taurus right over here and humans and pig and the like. Well, what does that represent? Well, that represents DNA sequences 
that have actually that are actually present in cow because they're present in all these other they've been found a lot of them have been found by other people in cow they're just missing from the reference assembly so it's telling you something about how poor your reference assembly is how much is actually missing in the reference assembly so okay we figured that out but then we got these things down here and these two things are worms and I'll come back to that in in a minute so then we looked at the RNA data, and the RNA data, the top 10 hits in the RNA data, were all to vertebrates. So okay, it's just telling us some of the stuff that's missing from the reference assembly is actually genes that are being transcribed. So in other words, we were detecting in the RNA-seq data transcribed regions of the genome of this cow that when we mapped them back to the reference assembly weren't present within the reference assembly. And in fact, we estimated that uh, about 42% of all of the genes in that version of the re reference assembly were, were misassembled. So the reference assembly was, was, had very significant problems and they were misassembled. Now, when we removed all the vertebrates from the data, what did we find? So this is what we found when we removed all of the vertebrates. These four things up here, these four things down here, this is in common with this up here. What are these things? These three things are worms, and this thing down here, it is a protozoan. And interestingly, none of these, oh, and there's a tick down here too. Um, where is it? Right, uh, bah, bah, bah. okay. Uh, yeah, this protozoan causes tick fever right down here, Babesia bogemia, causes tick fever. Now, we know that none of these parasites, none of these, these worms or this protozoan actually live in the United States. Okay, we eradicated tick fever in the United States in about the 1920s. That vector, that parasite was, was eradicated from the country. And all these other worms are found in, in Africa and Asia. They're not found in the United States. So what, what does that mean? Why did we find them? Um, what that means, oh, and I'll just draw your attention to this if you're interested. Um, go to Google or go to YouTube and type in mouth extraction, Alan captures his nematode. And take a look at that video. It, uh, it shows you that, that these parasites actually will in, infect more than, more than cattle. This is uh, a guy capturing his own nematode infection from his mouth. It's pretty gross. Um, but what, this, what these data are telling us is, is this, that there's actually a problem with any kind of nucleic acid sequencing approach, even though it's the best approach. You don't need to have to culture anything to try to identify the pathogens that are present with, within individuals. The problem is we've actually sequenced the genomes of less than 1% of the species that are present on the planet. And what we're finding is the thing that's kind of closest right, to the pathogen that's present within this cow. So the things we find, the species that we find, have the closest sequence homology to the sequences we generated when we sequenced the DNA or the RNA from this cow. So we don't really know what these pathogens are, and I would argue we probably, they're probably novel. They've probably never been discovered. They've probably never been characterized. These are new species that we're actually finding through this process. But the cool thing is, once you've got the sequences for them, you can develop diagnostics, PCR-based diagnostics, to actually test whether or not they're present within individuals. So this is a very, very powerful technique to find pathogens, even though you may not fully understand what the pathogen is, what the species is, when you actually detect the pathogen. So th this just shows you every time we sequence the genome, several people have talked about uh, sequencing the genomes of cattle and 2,000 and 3,000 animals. You're actually doing a metagenomic study, right? When you actually take nucleic acids out of the blood of an animal, which is the usual source we use, you're sequencing every nucleic acid that's actually present within the blood. Now most of that is going to be from the organism, the animal that you're actually sequencing, but any pathogens that are floating around, you're also going to be sequencing, and they're going to be at low level 
and they're not going to align to the reference assembly when you align it to the reference assembly. So it's sometimes worthwhile digging into the reference assembly, uh, the, the, the reads that don't map to the reference assembly, and look and see what you've got in there, because you'll find some interesting data about the animals in the population that you're looking at. This work was done by Lindsay Whitaker and published uh, several years ago. So back to the, to the BRD project in, spe in specific, we wrote this project in 2010, and this just shows the overall structure, and, and as usual, um, Alison was the boss. She wasn't the overall boss, Jim Womack was the overall boss, but she was the boss of all of the extension work, and you know why? Because she's really, really good at it. And Holly Nybergs at Washington State University was the overall leader of research. And these two guys over here, at, um, Milt was at Colorado State and Robert was at uh, New Mexico State University, provided leadership for the educational group. And I was down here among the troops. And my job was basically to work with these, these teams when they gathered large data sets and try to get them analyzed in a way that we could basically make some sense of, of BRD and the susceptibility to BRD in, in the US cattle population. And so this is what we ended up generating. And I just want to point out that the data that I'm showing you on this slide uh, ended up costing about 5 million reais to produce the data. It was about one and a quarter million data, uh, dollars to generate the data that are shown here. So we actually sampled four populations. Two of them were beef cattle. So in Colorado and in Washington, these are beef cattle populations. And the reported breeds of the individuals represented in those samples are given right here. About 1,000 individuals in each of those populations representing equal numbers of BRD cases and BRD controls. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. In California and New Mexico, the samples were about 2,000 animals and 750 animals and they were indeed all Holsteins. So we ended up with combinations of beef and dairy animals. Every single one of those animals had DNA sampled, extracted, and genotyped with the bovine HD, which has 778,000 SNPs on it. Um, each of those animals had deep pharyngeal swabs taken and sent to the diagnostic lab to actually test for the pathogens that could be found within the respiratory tracts of these animals. Um, and each of these animals was scored by veterinarians for something called the McGuirt Clinical um, Score uh, to diagnose cases and controls, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, and there was a total of 4,700 animals in, the, in this project. So this is the McGuirt scoring system, um, and if there are vets, you've seen this before, I'm sure. Essentially, there are five phenotypes that are measured on each animal. And each of these is scored from zero to three. And if it's rectal temperature, for example, if your rectal temperature is that, in that range, you get a zero. If your rectal temperature is over 103 degrees, you've got a three. And the same thing for cough, nasal discharge, eye scores, and ear scores. And the way this thing works is for each animal, you take the highest eye and ear score, whichever is the biggest, you take that score, and then you add that to the score for the other three traits, and you'll end up with a score that goes from zero to about 16, from zero to 16. And if you do that on a random sample of individuals, what you'll get is a big bimodal distribution that looks like that. And the trough occurs at about a score of six. Animals that have scores above six are sick. And animals that have scores below six, six are not sick. And it works very well. It's actually a very accurate diagnostic of whether or not animals are sick. So what we wanted to do, and remember when we wrote this, we wrote this back in, the, the grant was written back in 2010. And back in those days, we were sort of, some of us at least, were a little bit delusional. We'd just built the bovine SNP-50 assay. And having built the bovine SNP-50 assay, we kind of thought that, you know, we'd all go out there and try genomic selection. And all you'd have to do to implement genomic selection would be to get a whole bunch of animals together, measure a phenotype of some kind, milk production or disease resistance on those animals, genotype them with some assay, and build a prediction model. And here's my, here's my equation. That's my prediction model right there. Dan will know what that is. That is the regression of SNP effects on the breeding values of the animals. So in other words, you can do a standard GBLOP 
estimate the breeding values, the molecular breeding values, and then you can get these SNP effects just simply, very simply, from that regression. But once you've got those SNP effects, you can build an equation to predict the genetic merit of any animal. So as a new animal comes along that you don't have a phenotype for, but you genotype that animal, you simply take the genotypes, weight those, those allele substitution effects, and you get an estimate for the genetic merit of those animals. And then you validate and say, does it work? Do I have a reasonable accuracy? And if it works, you deploy. And back in 2010, we thought it really didn't matter what breed you used, or at least some of us did. I did. I was delusional. Um, it really wouldn't matter which breeds you used to do this. Once you built these equations, you'd be able to take that model anywhere you wanted and apply it anywhere you wanted to actually make genetic improvement. Well, it didn't take us very long to figure out that that's just not true. And the reason that that's not true is that we're not selecting on the causal variance. As John has already pointed out, we're just selecting on a SNP that tags a bit of a chromosome and whatever alleles are nearby on each of those chromosomes is what you're detecting with the two alleles at the SNPs or with the haplotype of SNPs that you're actually using. And that differs across breeds. So breeds are evolutionarily sufficiently distinct that their chromosomal architectures have recombined and they have different chromosomal architectures of variants at the causal or causal loci. That's why it doesn't, it doesn't work. We didn't realize that at the start. So when we took these data, um, my lab's been working on analyzing these data. And so we did that a number of different ways. So first of all, we had to filter out the animals that didn't genotype particularly well. And we lost, lost some animals because of that. Um, and that brought us down to 4,400 animals in, in combination. But we had the four separate populations that we could analyze. Clearly, we could combine the two Holstein populations, because Holsteins in New Mexico, right, are the same as Holsteins in California. We can combine those and do that analysis. And the beef population is primarily Angus, so we can combine the Angus that were in Colorado with the Angus that were in um, uh, Washington State and analyze those. And while we're about it, let's just throw everything together and do that analysis and see what happens in that analysis. So when you do that, some interesting things happen. So the first thing I observed was that if you look at what I call chip heritability, and I like chip heritability, and every time I write that in a paper, reviewers tell me to throw that out. But I like chip heritability because what it reflects is how much of the variation you can explain in the trait given the set of markers that are represented on your chips. Right? And chips have different properties in terms of the markers that are present on them. So with the 800K SNP chip, this is what we found. So here's the percent variation in Washington, Colorado, the two beef populations. Here's New, Me here's New Mexico. Here's California. And I was staggered because kind of the smallest is 21% and the largest is 23%. Who would have thought that we would estimate 4% variances in these different populations and they'd all be within a couple of percent of each other? Remarkably consistent. When we combined the beef populations, it did exactly what we thought the actual percent variance explained was just a little bit midway between those two. It's exactly what you'd expect statistically. But when we combine the New Mexico and the California populations, that dropped to 13%. And that just didn't make sense. Why would it drop to 13%? So what we did next to try to explain that was a bivariate analysis. So we did an analysis treating BRD in New Mexico as being a different trait to BRD in California, and we fit the bivariate model and we estimate the genetic correlation between those. And this is what we found. The genetic correlation between BRD, risk of BRD in California, and risk of BRD in New Mexico is negative 36%. So you think they're the same traits? Where's John Cole? What would you do if you were looking at lactation one, lactation two, lactation three, right? You guys start getting nervous when the genetic correlation drops below about 95%, right? So here we have a genetic correlation that's like negative 36%. What the hell does that mean? I mean, I looked at that and, and just thought, I just don't understand what this is. So it took us a little time to figure out exactly what that is. The first thing we did was we said, are the Holsteins that are in California different to the Holsteins in New Mexico? 
So here's the genomic relationship matrix. Here's all, all the Holsteins, 2,000 Holsteins from California, and here's the 700 from New Mexico, and that's how they're related to each other. And it looks just like how these are related to each other and how these are related to each other. There's, there's no difference between the Holsteins in those two populations. So it's not some sort of artificial stratification that's going on in the population. What I think it is is this. What I think it is is if you actually look at the pathogens that are present within the pharyngeal swabs of the animals in those two populations, there's very different pathogen profiles within those two different environments. And what you can see is in California, Manheimia hemolytica is much more prevalent than it is in New Mexico, as is bovine respiratory since initial virus, much more prevalent in California than it is in New Mexico. And here we've, we've got hemolytic uh, streptococcus, much more prevalent in New Mexico, and uh, arcanobacteria, much more prevalent in New Mexico than in California. So what we're looking at here is animals that are sick and have BRD, but the pathogens that are causing that sickness are different between the two populations. That really took the wind out of my sails when we got to this part. So now we've got the problem that the phenotype we're collecting to measure whether or not animals are sick may not be comparable across different points in time or across different regions of the country, right? Because it depends on what the pathogen profile does. Does the pathogen profile stay the same in winter as it is in summer? Does the pathogen profile differ if you go to Wisconsin? So if those things occur, then now we've got an even greater problem than the differences between breeds. So even collecting data strictly within these, these Holstein animals, right, may, those data may not be useful for the country as a whole. To build prediction of genetic merit for disease resistance because the pathogen profile is so volatile or varies spatially across the country. So that was a little bit depressing. So we decided to do some exploration and see whether or not there were anything we could do that would help salvage this problem. One of the things we observed was the heritability did not go to zero when we pulled those two populations. It dropped from about 22% down to about 13%. So what that tells us is that there are common loci that underlie disease susceptibility in both of those populations. And so the issue is perhaps we can drill in on those and capitalize on the loci that are common to disease susceptibility. And the next thing we wanted to do is say, all right, let's not mess around here. Let's not just deal with the SNP chip. Let's impute this up to whole genome sequence. So we had whole genome sequence on about 2,500 animals from the uh, Thousand Bull Project. Our group has actually sequenced about 500 animals, including 30 or 40 um, Holsteins. And we've built an imputation pipeline um, that actually works phenomenally well. And, and so we imputed these animals up to whole genome sequence. We then filtered, like most people do, um, minor allele frequency down to 5%. And the reason you tend to do that is it's very difficult to accurately impute rare loci. So just about everybody trims off that rare variation. And I'm going to come back to that at the, in a little bit. And then we redid the analysis. And we said, all right, if we now use 9.2 million markers throughout the genome, what does that do in terms of improving accuracy? And you get a little bit of uh, increase in percent variance explained, and this has generally been found. In other words, what you're doing is you're putting enough damn markers in there across the genome that you find things that are slightly more associated with the causal loci than what you had on the 800K chip, right? So you actually have a slightly uh, better ability to be able to explain variation in the trait. That doesn't mean that you have a better ability to predict genetic merit. Um, and in fact, the accuracies drop. So what we're showing here is a two-fold cross-validation process where what we did was train in half of the animals in New Mexico, validate in the other half, and see whether or not um, the, the, the correlation between the predicted genetic merit and the actual phenotype of those animals. So that's what we're showing here. So these correlations are not dreadfully strong. But the HD data is much stronger than the whole genome sequence data. And of course, the reason for that is that you're hopelessly underpowered uh, 
right, to be esti we're estimating 9 million SNP effects here, and s there's noise getting into the analysis. But we wanted to do this because the next thing we wanted to do was filter our way through those SNPs, actually try to apply some biology to those SNPs and look at different regions of the genome, but use all of the variation that we could within those regions of the genome. So this just shows you how hopelessly underpowered we were. Even with 2,700 animals in that joint analysis, the California and the New Mexico um, um, population, this is the QQ plot when we used the 700,000 SNPs and it shows you're overfitting. You know, we just don't have significant, we just don't have a hell of a lot of power. It doesn't get a whole lot worse when you actually do 9.2 million, but it's still not great. And, and when I look at this, you know, it tells us if, if I'd had this, these data before we did the project, I would have come back and done like 10,000 Holsteins and, and focused some attention um, purely on the Holstein population. Probably wouldn't have got funded, but that's what we would have really needed to have done. Um, what it does do, which is kind of neat, is really change the resolution of the landscape, the QTL landscape. And this just shows you a couple of QTLs. So this is the bovine HD uh, GWAS, and you see there's nothing very significant here. We're underpowered. Um, there's no single genes of huge, large effect. There's just lots and lots of small effect QTLs across the genome. This is chromosome 17, a region of chromosome 17. This is what the HD data look like. This is the impute, this is the chromosome 27, what the HD data look like. When you impute the whole genome sequence and you, you go up a hundredfold in terms of the number of markers that you're analyzing, you get just really crisp res resolution um, in those regions. And you start seeing signal that's indicative of regions that you actually probably have QTLs lying in those regions of the genome. So it helps you, I think, refine where you are in the, in the genome um, looking at variants that, that are causal, this is probably where they are. But of course, we've got this type 1 error problem that, that John indicated, because we really have an it overly large number of, of um, SNPs that we're fitting relative to the number of animals that we've got in the population. Invariably, you find this. I'm going to show you two pieces of data that support this. So th that's that region on chromosome 27. And here's our little QTL right up at this end of the chromosome. There's a gap there because the sequence assembly's got a hole in it right there. And, and so that's the region that we're looking at. And what we're looking at down here is everything annotated in the gene, on, the, on that chromosome that's transcribed. So that's all the transcribed loci that are present there. And if we sort of draw a little dotted line through that, it oh, doesn't go anywhere near a transcribed locus. So what's that suggesting? It's suggesting this is not some sort of amino acid substitution in a, in a gene, that what we're really looking at here is something that's probably regulatory. And who knows what it's regulating? It may be cis, it may be trans, but it's probably a, a regulatory effect. And I'll show you another piece of data that substantiates that uh, in a minute. So the first thing we wanted to do to try to get at the biology was say, Let's do some feature selection. Let's take the 9 million imputed SNPs and let's filter them down to only consider regions of the genome where there are SNPs that may have some functional relevance to respiratory disease, right? And we did that two different ways. The first way we did that was to say, well, we've done these three analyses of the California data, the New Mexico data, California and New Mexico. Let's just take the top 100 QTLs from each of those analyses. Let's just look at those regions and pull all the SNPs out in those regions and analyze that, right, and see what, see what that does. So we did that, and that gets us down to about 500, so from 9.2 million SNPs to about 530,000 SNPs. I'm not going to tell you how we did that, but we used some sort of local regression to figure out the size of the QTL region. So these are not fixed size QTL regions, it's based upon the signal that we have in each of those regions. So we got about 500,000, but we have to be aware that when we do this, that, 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 that in introduces a problem, right? We just analyzed the data to figure out the SNPs that we want to use when we reanalyze the same data to actually figure out the effect that that has on, on risk of BRD. So there's a dependency that's been introduced into the analysis. But we have no choice because there's no other data out there that I know of that we can use that tells us what are the QTLs that underlie variation in BRD risk. We either do this or we do nothing, right? There's no choice here. 
in, in how we go forward with that. We also did an RNA-seq based approach. Um, so we did a challenge experiment, or at least the University of California did an experimental challenge where they took four naive animals that hadn't been exposed to pathogens, and each of those groups of four were challenged with one of the pathogens of the complex, and there were six different pathogens that were tested. And then we had a control group. We took those animals to the point that they were sick, as sick as they were going to get. They were slaughtered. We harvested tissues from them. We did RNA-seq. And the RNA-seq work was, was done um, at the University of Missouri um, with my group, but it was really led by, by two very important people. This is Miss Brazil. Is she in the, in the audience? Polly? Yes, she is, Miss Brazil. So she was the pioneer here and published the very first paper where she basically an analyzed the bron bronchial lymph nodes on these individuals. And this guy's Mr. India. This is Susanta Bahura, who also works with our group. He analyzed all of the tissues together and actually looked for whether or not there was crosstalk between the tissues in terms of how they coordinate the immune response to these pathogens. Very nice paper. They're both published. If you want to track them down and have a read, you can do that. But, but what we did was we took the bronchial lymph node data, which I think is probably the best of the single tissues, and for, for the thousand genes that had the largest difference, statistical difference in expression between the challenged animals and the control animals, we pulled out a region 25 KB upstream and downstream, we pulled all the SNPs out from them. And why did we do that? Well, these are the genes that appear to be associated with the normal immune response to infection with the pathogen. So variants within those genes or upstream of those genes or downstream of those genes may be associated with risk of disease. So, and the important thing is that this is an independent data set, right? We're not reusing the BRD data set to be able to do that. So that resulted in 310,000 SNPs. And then we said, well, let's put the two of them together. We'll put the QTL data in with the RNA-seq data, and we'll do that too. And when we did that, we ended up with 800,000 SNPs, and there were 8,000 SNPs in common between those two data sets. So the top 100 QTLs, the regions of the genome where we found the top 100 QTLs, the regions of the genome where we found the top 1,000 differentially expressed genes associated with disease, essentially have no overlap. And what does that tell you? And that tells me that we're not looking at coding regions. We're looking at regulatory regions that are associated with the regulation of these genes that underlie the QTLs that are there in the population. So we did the analysis, and lo and behold, um, this, this shows you basically when you train in New Mexico in half the population and validate in New Mexico in half the population, this is the accuracy that you achieve. And this is using the HD assay. This is using whole genome sequence. This, is using, this one right here is using QTLs. This one right here is using feature selection RNA-seq. Um, and this is the two of them together, the two data sets put together. And what we see from that is interesting is in that we get an increase right here. The biggest increase that we get is associated with using QTLs. And if you look at the data for using the RNA-seq, you don't accomplish very much using transcribed the SNPs that are present within the transcribed regions of the genome that have the genes that are involved in the immune response to the pathogens. No effect. It's not any better than just taking 800,000 randomly selected SNPs in the genome. But over here, this is when you train in one of the, in one of the populations. So if you train in California and then predict in New Mexico, it's not negative anymore. You're positive. So the QTL regions are interesting, primarily because we know that, that, that we're, we're overestimating what this accuracy is, because we're double using the data. We know we're double using the data. But the interesting thing that we see is, I think, these data here. When you train using data only in California, and we now come back and predict genetic merit, risk of BRD for the animals in the other state, despite the fact that there's a negative correlation between the phenotypes, you get a positive prediction accuracy. That was, that was exciting. But we know that they're biased. 
those are the things that are interested, interesting. We wanted to have a look at the bias. And is there a way that we can actually try to disentangle what that bias was? What we did was something pretty complicated. And first of all, did five-fold cross-validation. So we took the animals, we divided them into five separate groups. We used four groups to predict where the QTLs were. We used the SNPs in those QTL regions to build our model, and then we predicted in the fourth, right? And, and when we did that, a couple of interesting things happened. The accuracy dropped substantially. So we really are biased. We're, this approach really is biased. But when we did that, only 53% of the QTLs, on average, were in common with what we found when we analyzed the entire data set. In other words, you're getting a lot of information loss because we don't have enough power in this data set to accurately identify where the QTLs were. So we want to try and let's see if we could solve that problem. One way to solve that problem is let's do 135-fold cross-validation. So we'll take of the 2,659 animals, we'll take 20 out and we'll just use the rest to predict where the QTLs were. So that ought to look a hell of a lot like what we did with 2,700 animals, right? We're only taking 20 animals out. When we did that, what we found, that only 91% of the QTLs were in common. So it's very sensitive to the animals that are present within the GWAS. What does that tell you? You're underpowered, right? We're not accurately identifying where all of the QTLs are within, within that population. So the last thing I'm going to tell you about before I sort of summarize all this stuff for you, is the next thing that we did was we built a new genotyping assay. And you may or may not be aware of this, but there's an assay that's been commercialized by GeneSeq that's called the GGPF250. And it's an assay that we built that has what we hope is functional variation on it. So that's what the F is in the F250. 250 meaning 250,000 loci designed onto it. And what we did was we took all of the sequence data that we had available, we did SNP discovery, and then we designed this assay to include things that, that would look like there were um, um, substitutions within amino acid substitutions, and there are about 70 or 80,000 amino acid substitutions, things that caused frame shifts within genes, so they're all gene-centric, nearly all gene-centric on this assay. And we genotyped this assay in about 20,000 individuals, but 2,000 of the Holsteins that came from um, the California and New Mexico populations. So we then imputed everybody up to the joint 850,000 markers, which is this little group in blue right here. So that is the combination of 800, 800K bovine HD assay plus GGPF250, and that's comparing it to the HD assay. These were filtered so that anything with less than 5% was dropped out. These were not filtered. Rare variation is included. So there is an awful lot of rare variation. And what we found was a very significant increase in the percent variation explained and in the accuracy of our predicted MBVs when we were using rare variation. And so I think what this is telling us is um, a lot of these causal variants that we're looking for are potentially very rare in the population. I think a lot of them are amino acid substitutions. If you look at the allele frequency distribution for these amino acid substitutions, the majority of them are very, very rare in the population. And that's not just due to chance. That's due to the fact I think they're being selected against. So if you want, um, John, if you, if you want some candidates for for genome editing, I think I can point you to probably about 60,000 of them pretty quickly. The problem is, is they're going to be different in different animals because they're also so rare. But I actually think that that is responsible for a lot of the missing heritability that we were seeing in, in the earlier GWASs, that there's a lot of rare variation in the population and it's functional. And that shouldn't be surprising, right? I mean, it just shouldn't be surprising that common versus rare alleles, the majority ought to be rare because you know, the, the majority of true causative effects ought to be rare in the population, right? Because the majority of, of variants within the genome of humans or cattle are rare. So 
there's a lot of information there, I think, that, that, that is ready to be harvested. Okay. So here's kind of where I'm at with this. Um, the McGuirk scoring system that we used in this, I think, is very valuable. It's very accurate. It tells you whether or not an animal's sick. Um, or not sick. The problem is it doesn't tell you why the animal is sick. It doesn't tell you what pathogen caused that animal to be sick. It's a non-specific diagnosis, and that's a problem. Um, the immune response that we're seeing when we look at the RNA-seq data is generally pathogen-specific, but there's a lot of commonality in there. If you look at the genes that are differentially expressed in the normal response to infection, you see commonality between all the viruses, you see commonality uh, between the bacteria, and even between bacteria and viruses. So inflammation, for example, those are associated with inflammation, um, all turn up in, in that analysis. Um, the genetic variants that are causal, that cause susceptibility, to disease span the allele frequency spectrum. They're common. There are a few common ones. There are many, I think, rare ones. I think the data that we've got here tell us that most of them are going to be regulatory. They're not, a, not amino acid substitutions, but some will be amino acid substitutions, but many are going to be regulatory. Um, there's some commonality across regions, and we know that, and this is regions of the, of the country, because we actually detect some common QTLs in the analysis of the animals from California and the animals from New Mexico. But our sample sizes that we've generated to this point, I think, are too small. They're too small to characterize whether or not there's diversity in pathogens across time or across regions. They're too small to accurately identify QTLs. They're too small to, to, to drill in on potential causal variants um, and validate models for risk um, in any individual breed. So we currently have a grant that's going to help us, I hope, uh, drill into some of these regulatory regions. Um, and we were funded with a tripartite grant that involves uh, two groups in Ireland and our group at the University of Missouri. Um, and what we're doing is we're taking the tissue samples from the animals that were in the, the challenge experiment and doing ATAC-seq. And ATAC-seq is a method that looks for regions of open chromatin within those tissues that are regulatory, that are controlling the expression of the genes that are involved in, in the immune response. And I think we've made pretty good progress on, on this. It's been tough because we're dealing with frozen tissues, so it's not just usual ATAC-seq. We've got frozen tissues, and that's been a problem for us. So we've made some good libraries. I think we've got repeatable data. We can now show that we can repeatably identify the same regions um, in tissues. So I think we're very close to actually narrowing down again regions of the genome that are going to have regulatory effects on, they're going to have functional effects through their regulation of the genes involved in the immune response. And we're interested to see what that does. Um, disease is immensely costly to livestock production. Um, phenotypes are not routinely collected. That's a huge problem, and I think that that's unlikely to change. I mean, the cost of generating the phenotypes for this project was enormous, and I don't think any industry is going to invest uh, that amount of money to, to do that. Um, we need to know not that an animal is sick, we need to know why the animal is sick. So that requires more than just measuring rectal temperature and whether or not it's flicking its ears and the nose is, is there. You've got to actually go in and try to figure out what pathogen caused it. And that's not too easy either because by the time you realize the animal's sick, the pathogen that caused the illness may not be in the pharynx of that animal. It may have moved into the lungs of the animal and you may not find it. So that's another a, a problem. So I actually think that phenotypic selection um, is unlikely to be very effective um, to do this unless, as John said, we can actually come up with cost-effective, high-throughput ways of phenotyping animals for things like their rectal temperature using probes um, and, and video cameras to measure their head activity, for example, so that we can inexpensively capture these phenotypes on large numbers of animals. So genomic selection, eh, damn it. Genomic selection, I think, is going to have to try to drill in on identifying some of the causal variants that underlie risk of disease 
and building MBVs based upon those, and if they have any kind of accuracy at all, using pretty much the same approach that John described earlier, which is saying, you know, we genotype, we impute, we use GWAS, we use RNA-seq, we use ATAC-seq, we intersect all of this information and try to identify the variants in the genome that are potentially candidates and then filter our way through those to try to identify somehow the ones that are likely to be causal. And I think this is such a huge problem, and I don't know where the money's going to come from to do this, that my final comment here is that I suspect, given what I know about um, you know, the history of gene editing, in that there are animals that have been edited to be resistant to Staphylococcus. Um, Alison Shake gave us an example. That was 2005, right? Um, we know that the guys at Missouri, so Kevin Wells was actually on that paper. He was one of the guys that made that, that Staphylococcus resistant Holstein. Um, they're in the process of making pigs that they believe will be resistant to all viruses. All viruses. That pig has actually been made and is being tested right now. And if that's possible, should it not be possible to make cows that are resistant to viruses? And if we can use gene editing to make cows that are resistant to viruses, then clearly this is the way to tackle this problem, not what we've been trying to do right here. So with that, um, I just want to thank the people that funded all of this work, the USDA. Um, this is Jesse Hoff, the student that did a lot of this work and who was in Brazil a couple of years ago. Um, and with that, I'll just say thanks for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jerry. And as the last uh, talk, and not the least, the least important, I would like to invite Professor Daniel Gianola to give a wrap-up of this conference and make his considerations. I knew Professor Gianola in 1991, maybe, in one of the original meetings of the American Society of Animal Science where we presented a paper on swine. I guess it was one of the first papers on animal model applied to swine. And me and another paper was presented by Eildert Gronveld from Germany. That was in Illinois at that time, I guess. And he pressed us a lot. And we continued changing emails. That was the, the Jurassic email. I don't know, it was BitNet at that time. For two months. <laughs> And I learned a lot from Professor Janala. And when he, we, we entered in contact through email, I just invited him to for, for this conference so he can make his very important considerations. He is prof professor honoris causa and for several universities, one of the most important stati statisticians of the moment. So it's an honor to have you here. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Bento. Uh, I would like first to, to make some comments about differences between countries. I, I, I was born in Uruguay, and uh, in Uruguay the governments change and the hospitality stays constant. In the United States the government change and the hospitality gets worse. In Brazil the governments change, the hospitality gets better. So, you know, keep up. Not changing governments, just hospitality, I meant. Okay, um, let's see, right. Um, I'm going to talk about life and about abstractions. Uh, five slides will be about life, the rest will be about abstractions. Um, for the benefit of our visitors from other countries, um, this is Neymar, he's one of the most talented football players ever. He was endowed by life to be a great football player. So that's life. These other two players are uh, Luca Torreira and Bruno Mendes. Bruno Mendes uh, just transferred to Brazil. He's 17 years old. And Luca Torreira plays in Arsenal. So they represent an abstraction because the coach told him, I'm going to use the following algorithm. Torreira comes from the right, Mendes comes from the left, and on average, we'll block Neymar. It, <laughs> I'm not sure it worked that time. In this game, Brazil won one to zero, and Neymar made a goal with a penalty. Um, we talk about complex traits. Why are traits complex? Well, 
because uh, what we measure, and God knows, you know, we have so many things to measure now, uh, they stem from uh, a huge number of exquisitely integrated biochemical reactions that act in a concerted manner with the environment. Um, it must be true that interactions among genes is a fundamental force in biology because uh, biochemical reactions are organized into cycles. This is a cycle that you learn at least five times when you go to school, the Krebs cycle. There are 12 enzymes that intervene in that cycle. Um, if you use a paradigm, one gene, one enzyme, this implies that every pathway is controlled by many genes. And there is clear interaction here, because if you kill one of these enzymes, let's say by the gene knockout, the cycle stops. It, it, that, it does not work as a, you add or subtract like the standard IT genetic model uh, suggests. And thirdly, uh, the, what we observe must be the, the outcome of highly nonlinear relationships because enzyme kinetics, which is based on Michaelis, Ment, and logic, uh, is intrinsically nonlinear. When the substrate, when an enzyme works uh, very strongly, the reaction rate decreases. So on, on this basis, uh, I, I still have the view that uh, complex traits uh, are extremely difficult to learn from a causal perspective, especially small effect variants that are those that do matter from a complex trait uh, view. Um, so um, for this reason, uh, quantitative genetics and animal and plant breeding are special fields. Uh, they have dealt with abstractions. The first abstraction is to say that we, what we observe can be expressed as some function of genetic and environmental variables that could be independent or have some stochastic dependence or could be interacting. And there is a huge number of abstractions. For example, uh, I could pose this model, I could pose this model, or this, or this, or this, and that. And for convenience, animal and plant breeders have adopted just a linear decomposition of forces. And in plant breeding, they realize early in the game that genotype and environment interactions are, are very important. So these are, of course, uh, linear descriptions of a very complicated reality. So when we use statistical models, and more specifically linear models, we are saying we live in a straight line. It's like uh, if you go out and you say the horizon, say the world is flat. Well, it's a local approximation, but it's not necessarily a good mechanistic description of life. And this is important to realize because many quantitative geneticists believe that a linear model is life. No, it's just an abstraction. Okay, um, before genes were discovered, uh, there was a concept by Francis Galton called the regression of offspring on parent. Uh, Galton observed that the children of tall parents, on average, were shorter than their parents, and the children of short parents were, on average, taller than their parents. But of course, he didn't know there was Mendelian segregation that would reconstitute variability, but he did observe a linear relationship between the stature in offspring and the stature of parents, and that gave a lot of impetus for linear models in the field of genetics. Um, this is a reanalysis of uh, Galton's data using a non-parametric method. The line is a uh, lowest fit of Galton's data, and you'll observe that even though uh, you get roughly a straight line, there is a bend. And that bend, stature is the most widely studied quantitative trait. Nobody has been able to explain why that bend has occurred. So there is something going on that we do not know yet. Um, Pearson wrote a uh, very large number of very important papers, and perhaps you do not know that he introduced the concept of a mixture of distributions. He was studying crabs in the Bay of Naples. He uh, observed 
that the distribution was bimodal, and then he said, well, I'm going to assume that this bimodality assumes, because there are two populations, each population has a normal distribution, and they enter into different proportions. A mixture of models are very powerful ways of analyzing data, because the more components you have in a mixture, the closer you can approximate any distribution. That's a well-known result, and it's actually exploited non-parametrically, because density estimation, the good density estimator are actually a mixture of Gaussian distributions. But some people have got really wild and they have invented models with mixtures, to which I will refer later on. Okay, our, our field, animal breeding, and I'll also take the liberty of saying plant breeding, uh, became a science uh, when these three giants set the foundation. From left to right, uh, right, so all right, he introduced the concept of the coefficient of inbreeding. He was a pioneer in structural equation modeling, and he has this incredible result of finding the equilibrium distribution of allelic frequencies in a no mutation, no selection model. That it, 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 he just saw that that was responded to the Fokker Planck uh, equation of, of physics and published this result without the proof. Uh, Ronald Fisher, uh, he's the founding father of modern mathematical statistics, uh, he introduced the infinitesimal model, where he claimed that we, if we assume that uh, there are an infinite number of, uh, of loci with an infinite number of alleles, each with an infinitesimal small effect, we create a normal distribution. He, in this paper, he introduced the analysis of variance, the notion of idiomatic variance, and also some uh, dominance and epistatic components. So this, this was actually probably the most influential paper in the field of quantitative genetics. And to the right, uh, Haldane, perhaps the most colorful of the three, the most interesting, but we don't have to get into anecdotes, saved for saying that he resigned the British citizenship, and here's in a, a photo in India when he took off Indian citizenship. Haldane has many interesting papers. One that is, uh, was of special interest to me is that one on estimating mutation rates where he used Bayes' theorem. And another one uh, was on stabilizing selection that is something I've been interested in for, for some time. I'm, I'm working on it. But we needed to put this together in an agricultural context, and the person that did this was Professor Jay Lash. Jay Lash, uh, put together ideas from these three giants. Uh, he published animal breeding plants, and he had these class notes called the genetic of populations that became a book later on, and he put it together. And he founded the important group in Iowa State University, which continues to be one of the leading uh, groups in the world. Uh, but perhaps what you do not know is that he got, he got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin in 1922. Okay, this is uh, Fisher's paper. I already said this. Uh, a, a word of encouragement for students. When uh, Fisher uh, sent his paper, he was an undergraduate in Cambridge, and the paper was rejected. And the two reviewers that said that it was totally useless. They could not see a way in which this could be serve any useful purpose. So. Remember that lesson. Don't get discouraged because most of the times the reviewers are wrong. Um, I, I'm just bringing this up for the sake of fairness. Uh, we use a lot of selection index uh, in animal breeding, which is a way of combining multiple traits into a breeding objective and then to predict this thing that is called aggregatic merit. But actually, this, this idea was developed first in plant breeding by uh, an Australian, actually, Fairfield Smith in Canberra in 1936. And then uh, today, this is a really trivial result, and it's a special case of a more general theory called best linear prediction. But of course, it has been superseded because now we can deal with nonlinear functions and estimate any, any function, even if it is trigonometric, if we want to. Um, the concept was actually picked up in animal being by Lanoy Hazel, also from Iowa State, and uh, 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 in that paper, I think, the notion of the genetic correlation between traits is introduced. So here, let's say we have two phenotypes. Uh, these phenotypes are assumed to be affected by genetic and environmental factors. 
these uh, genetic factors are correlated, so there may, may be some cause, genetic causes of commonality, and the environmental factors are uh, also associated, so there are some causes of environmental commonality, and Hazel showed up that the phenotypic correlation has these two components, where this is the square root of heritability, and one minus the heritability, I baptize it, I call the anti-heritabilities, like Christ and anti-Christ. And uh, I think John Cole uh, point made a, a very relevant observation today that there, there, there is a hell of a lot more opportunity for environmental modeling and for genetic modeling because most traits have low heritability. And we spend a tremendous amount of time in 25% of the variability and we do not worry that much on the 75%. And we know statistically that working in all parts of the model is relevant to, from the point of view of enhancing prediction. Okay, so if you have a good environmental model, you probably get better genetic predictions. Um, really, theoretically, not much progress was made since 1918 until Henderson. Henderson is a giant, but when you look at it retrospectively, this is what Henderson did. Uh, Fisher's mean became a mean vector. Mu became X beta. Fisher's VA became A sigma square A, where A is the numerator relationship matrix. But then, of course, he developed the mixed model equations. He did not know that that was the best linear bias predictor that was proved later on. Uh, then he found that this remarkable thing that the numerator relates to matrix as an extreme have inverse, and then blab was extended in every possible direction you can think of, longitudinal, cross-sectional, uh, multi-dimensional. You can even predict uh, individuals do not exist, and you can actually estimate things that do not exist either. Okay? Uh, it led to more efficient production of milk, meat, eggs, and fiber, but there were no genes, no minor infrequencies, no LD, no causal variance, no nature genetics, no NIH, no glamour. And that's what I was trying to say yesterday. If you do things uh, from an agricultural perspective, you are, of course, not a very glamorous person. But if you do things that medical scientists do, and they have a hell of a lot of money, some of them succeed, some do not, so most of us live in a completely non-glamorous world. But I, I'm not saying this with envy, I'm just saying this is a word of caution, that uh, uh, be careful with uh, mirrors of colors. Uh, n smaller than p, n is the number of observation, p is the number of elements in the model, the unknowns, p can be larger than n, p can be smaller than n, and Henderson uh, discovered this set of linear equations that are called the, the mixed linear model equations that is actually an algorithm, eh? it's not a statistical method. Uh, Searle and Henderson later proved that it's a best linear bias predictor, something that's a really a convoluted definition, because actually uh, the best linear and bias predictor is not unbiased with respect to the true value, it's respect, unbiased with respect to the average. So if the average of the random fact distribution is zero, you are, what you're actually doing is you're estimating zero. But then it sh showed up that I had a much nicer, more elegant Bayesian interpretation. It was shown that it was a penalized maximal likely estimator. It was also shown to be similar to the Kriegin method in geostatistics that was developed in South Africa. It's a special case of reproducing kernel killer spaces regression, and it's also a linear neural network with an identity activation function. So according to the famer, famous statistician, Andrew Gelman, is like the Holy Roman Empire. So it's a good method. Uh, I want to bring uh, two names, uh, um, Walter Harvey, most of you never heard of this man, but he wrote a very useful package that uh, I don't know if Bento used it, but I did. Um, and then uh, he, impl he estimated variance components using method three of Henderson, it was available in his package, but then likelihood-based idea came up, 
and this person that you have here that has uh, something like a lamp is the head, is uh, one of the inventors of uh, restricted over surgical maximum likelihood, uh, Robin Thompson. He, was, he received an honorary doctorate from the Universidad Politécnica de Valencia. But it's a method that assumes Gaussianity, so it has to be used with caution when you uh, abandon the normal distribution assumption. Um, Henderson uh, published an enormously influential paper on how to predict breeding values when you have certain forms of selection. This paper was received uncritically by most animal readers. Some people still go like this. Uh, uh, the, the, the paper is based on a completely unrealistic model and it uses very strong assumptions that do not hold, such as fixicity of some matrices in conceptual repeated sampling. Uh, but then it was revisited from a missing data perspective from Donald Rubin, where he, Rubin introduced a concept of ignorability, when a missing data process is ignorable or not ignorable, uh, when it's missing at random or, not, or other forms. And a uh, statistician from France, uh, Sotan Im, adapted the, the ideas in the paper of Rubin, and he gave conditions under which one could estimate parameters in, in quantitative genetics, ignoring selection altogether. Uh, Robin Thompson and Robert Kernow had explored these, uh, uh, as well as Oscar Kempthorn, but not uh, with the power of missing data theory. Um, in the 50s, there was a revolution in both sides of the Atlantic where the foundations of statistics were revisited. And uh, two papers, uh, well, well, two, uh, lots of papers, especially Thomas Bayes, oh, sorry. How do I go back here? Um, this is a famous paper on the Bayes theorem that we all learn in the first course in statistics, but we never know how to do the denominator, so we always get it wrong. And this is uh, Pierre Simon de Laplace. He was born uh, many, many years after Bayes, but he was actually using something called in inverse probability. And uh, by Laplace was analyzing data. And this is crucially important. In science, okay, we have theories, and then uh, given a theory, you more or less describe what you would expect in terms of effects. Uh, the problem is that we are really interested in knowing how plausible our theories are. So actually the item of uncertainty is not the effects, because the effects you observe, but the causes you don't. So both Bayes and Laplace were interesting in assigning probability to the causes. And given the causes, then you would postulate the distribution of effects. So by inverting the learning system, you could assign probabilities to, I, to the real issues on which you are interested about, which are the causes of the phenomena. So this uh, led to a tremendous amount of revisitation of the foundations of statistics and probability theory. But roughly, the, the, this is a nice description of the problem built from a non-Bayesian, uh, Lyons from Oxford, he said that uh, Bayesians address the question everybody one is interested in by using assumption no one believes. Uh, on the other hand, the frequentists invent conceptual repeated sampling or something that you do an infinite number of times under exactly the same conditions, and then you construct, you, you violate the likelihood principle, which means that you have to make assumptions or statements about the things that you'll observe on things that you will never observe. So a Bayesian method roughly will uh, start as follows. You describe your uncertainty before your observed data. Then you make an experiment or a survey or something like this. And then at the end, you will combine uh, the strength of the prior information with the strength of the data into a posterior distribution. And if the model is right, if the parameters are likely identified, when sample size goes to infinity and the number of parameters remain constant, the posterior converges to the true value, which of course does not exist because the true values are the abstraction of our parameters and parameters do not exist. Okay. Um, 
I've been told that I was responsible for making uh, Bayesian methods popular in animal breeding. This was our first reviewed paper in 1986, but actually we started playing with Bayesian methods in 1982 with my colleague Jean-Louis Foulet from France. This was a paper published in, uh, in Journal of Animal Science. Uh, this, uh, we could not practice what we were preaching because the computers uh, would not allow us to do the sort of things you are expected to do if you are a full Bayesian. But then came the Markov chain Monte Carlo methods that were actually invented outside of statistics. Uh, actually, the first MCMC method was in, invented by a guy that was in the atomic bomb project called Nick Metropolis. Metropolis is the city where Superman lives. This guy was from Chicago, okay? But he, uh, he, he worked in Los Alamos. And then there was another algorithm called Gibbs Sampling that came from image analysis. And uh, statisticians in the late 80s saw that those method could be used to draw samples from distribution I do not know. And we took over the idea, and my student, uh, Kun Shan Wang, he, I think is now director of statistics in Pfizer. He was the first one that worked with uh, Gibbs sampling. Uh, in 1991, uh, we wrote a paper and we presented in Denmark. It was called Gibbs for Pigs. Very appropriate from Denmark. Um, so uh, then uh, uh, this MCMC method can be used to solve any Bayesian problem. Uh, but of course, uh, I, I think uh, John Hickey today gave us an extraordinary example of how imaginative a person can be, my chapeau. Uh, but uh, sometimes if you get statistically imaginative, it's more dangerous, okay? So uh, MCMC can allow you to do anything you want. You can have a wild prior, uh, you can measure data, and then you'll get something and you'll probably like what you get, okay? So anything can be done. Uh, those of you that are in genomic prediction, you know that there is a sequence of methods called base A, base B, base C, base C pi, base D, then came the Chinese base TA, base TB, base TC, and uh, so you could invent base G, R, 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 whatever, and, and you'll, get, you'll get numbers. That's great. Um, one of my former students, Robert Templeman, uh, in a beef cattle meeting, uh, said once, uh, I, I was talking about the MCMC, and, and Rob is a, is a good Bayesian, but much more realistic than I. He said that uh, what Dan is saying is that the uh, MCMC is great, but MCMC will never be used uh, in genomic evaluation of animal or plants. Well, remember James Bond film, Never Say Never Again? Uh, because then the stuff picked up, and the epitome is genomic selection. Okay, now until genomics came into a picture, and I will move into genomics uh, soon, um, we have Falconer's book where we learn about many things, expected response to selection, chain allelic frequencies, what happens with the mean of the variance, how you decompose genetic variance into, you know, the, remember the 2PQ alpha square, the dominance contribution, et cetera, et cetera. Great text, it's still a wonderful book to read. Uh, Alan Robertson was interested, among many other things. Uh, the, the, Alan Robertson passed away in 1987, if I remember correctly, an extraordinarily intelligent man that came from organic chemistry. And he, uh, he was working in that famous office of the special operations that were involved in the deciphering codes of the Nazis. Remember, you have seen the Enigma code story. Of, uh, but he, one of the things he was interested in is in what happens when you have a small population and you select uh, for a particular allele and uh, what is the probability that you will fix or what is the probability that the allele will come extinct. It's an important population genetic concept. And uh, I think most of you uh, have had an opportunity to meet uh, Bill Hill, another giant in our field. Uh, among hundreds of papers, all of them invariably relevant, um, he work a hell of a lot on linkage equilibrium. Everybody talked about it at that time. We couldn't see how we could use it. And now everybody's very interested. 
So, but we couldn't do anything until genomic era because uh, we didn't have genomic data. We, hadn't, we didn't have molecular data. So then came the markers, the SNPs, uh, and the ideas of, uh, of trying to tag parts of the genome uh, to phenotypic variation. So from now on, I'm going to talk about the uh, three main paradigms. So of course, the, 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 my definition of the paradigms is totally arbitrary. Uh, the first paradigm is uh, GWAS, and you have heard several references about that. Uh, the first GWAS was done in Japan uh, for macular degeneration in the eye. Uh, in 2017, there were 47,781 SNPs uh, that were found associated, they had been curated. If you dig into the literature, there are interesting GWASs like for the strength of your handshake, the propensity to cry, and if I may, erectile dysfunction. Now, the true, the erectile dysfunction paper it's very interesting, except that they do not say how they phenotyped. <laughs> okay, the, the basic, uh, you have seen this stuff several times today. Um, the, the standard GWAS uh, runs a regression, a linearly squared, so logistically squared, so something more glorified uh, with a genomic relation matrix or whatever, one marker at a time, and then because you do this over and over and over, you have to adapt for multiple testing. And the survivors, which are those that uh, uh, pass some uh, significant threshold, which is typically the outcome of some Mickey Mouse correction for multiple testing, they are declared significant. And uh, there are thousands, thousands of papers on, on GWAS, and, and it's done over and over and over and over and over. Now, imagine, imagine if Fisher were alive today. If, if you read uh, Fisher's experimental design book, he said, when you do an experiment, you have to think about all the possible factors that intervene in the experiment and address them s simultaneously. Of course, Fisher was talking about uh, treatment A, treatment B, treatment C, treatment D, and when you had more than four factors in the model, you had to do fractional factorials and do uh, the aliasing and constructing these fancy designs. Uh, we could not do experiments to uh, consider 1 million, 2 million, 30 million factors at a time, but Fisher's view would tell you that the GWAS is the queen of ambiguity. Okay? They talk about the king of the phenotypes, the king of that, well, I'll call GWAS the queen of ambiguity because GWAS, for a complex trait that is affected by so many things with very cryptic linkage equilibrium relationships. He's just telling you there is something here, but it's not necessarily what I'm searching for. It may be here, it may be close, it may be far, okay? Because we are ignoring everything else. It's a one factor at a time experimentation. It's actually one of the poorest forms of experimentation, but it's glamorous because uh, you can have nice visuals, Manhattan plots, uh, Chicago plots. Uh, I actually have a, a new term, uh, it's called the MUMA plots, it's the multivariate Manhattan plots, but MUMA is the nickname of my sister, and so that, that name is coming in the literature, hopefully. And then you do these fancy things with fancy colors, fancy graphs, and you publish stuff uh, in high profile journals. And uh, for some reason, the medical geneticists love this, this story, and they, they are using a one factor at a time thing for a thing that a priori is necessarily complex. All right. Um, I think we now know that uh, the outcomes of GWAS analysis seldom have predictive power, and not only seldom have predictive power, but they are not repeatable. They are not reproducible. The reason uh, why they don't have predictive power is because inference and prediction are different matters. Okay? And expecting to do predictions of a complex thing without one snip at a time uh, is just extremely optimistic. The, the second um, 
thing that I want to mention in terms of reproducibility is you probably know that in, uh, in many countries, the US is no exception, there is a great deal of concern about the reproducibility of, sec of results. And uh, a person from the Stanford uh, School of Medicine, Ioannidis, uh, recently published a paper where he went through uh, an analysis of thousands of publications. Uh, he found out that the abstracts of 96% of these publications had significant results, and only 4% did not report significant results. So there is obvious, an obvious selection bias. And when you, you have selection, when you look at for extremes, then when the thing is repeated, there is regression to the mean, like it happened to Galton. So that implies, and it's called the Beavis effect, that things that you think are, that turn out to be significant are not necessarily so when the experiment is repeated under the same condition but with different data sets. Um, as, a, as a side comment, this paper that was published in the Presidio National Academy of Sciences, these are the paradoxes. The, the author, Adeline Law, uh, says that significant variables aren't automatically good predictors. But she's a political scientist, so a political scientist should not talk about good prediction because she, you saw what happened in the U.S. election, okay? So uh, the, all, all these uh, political scientists really blew it. Okay, the second paradigm uh, which superseded the QTL paradigm, and I'm not going to spend any time in the QTL par part because uh, I think people still uh, work with the QTL concept, but the plant breeders have essentially abandoned QTLs. And uh, uh, I can quote Rex Bernardo, a very influential uh, maize breeder in that context. So um, Mewissen, uh, Ben Hayes, and my other suggest, okay, let's uh, use all available markers uh, to predict um, um, complex traits, and they introduce uh, base A, base B, and also they talk about blap of markers. And an important uh, component of that paper, which of course uh, um, uh, it, it takes a second level relative to the main message, is that they use cross-validation. And this is something I was lacking. If you, if you look at animal breeding and plant breeding papers before 2001, very few use cross-validation. We animal breeders thought that by making the models bigger and bigger and bigger, we we're going to do better. And we now know in the light of predictive science that that's not necessarily the case. Okay, and oh, sorry, uh, just as a comment. Uh, so this was uh, the Bayesian alphabet the last time I occurred to to write a, a comment. So uh, a third consequence of the paper is that it helped many young scientists to publish papers, to develop new methods by tweaking things uh, a little bit. So we have a, a, an extraordinary collection of uh, methods. John talked about this. Genotyping was, uh, was available, was readily picked up by the dairy industry and by all animal and animal being industries. Uh, we have indications that things have gotten faster. Uh, I think Allison showed this and John also showed that. Uh, where I'm not going to use the term genetic trends, okay? Because genomic and genetic trends are different things. The genomic trends have gone up for a milk yield, for fat yield, for protein yield, actually faster than expected. And, and another externality of, uh, of genomic selection is that uh, we have been able to reserve, uh, to reverse undesirable trends like the decay in reproductive efficiency and do better with uh, mammary gland diseases. So things seem to be working in the right direction. It was an, an, a very important development, not only in animal breeding but in plant breeding as well because uh, um, Genomic selection is used for palm oil, for sugar beets, for maize, for wheat, for cassava, for strawberry. I have not seen any paper in genomic selection wine yet. Okay, um, from a statistical point of view, um, I want to make uh, an important distinction between inference and, and prediction. Uh, in the inferential problem can be posed as follows. We have input data, 
say pedigree, genomic data, phenotypes, then we come up with a statistical model that is indexed by parameters and perhaps some other random variables, and then we have to learn these parameters, taking the view that the model is right, which of course is never the case, but let's say it's that the model is a good description of, of the mechanistics of the problem, and, uh, and then you have to choose an estimator, so you go to a statistician, they will give you their favorite recipe, and then uh, you will, will argue the theoretically using, for example, asymptotic theory, that if the model is right, in the limit, uh, you will converge to the true value, da, 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 da. Uh, but all these nice stuff, they are called oracle one and two, given that the, the model you hit is true, which happens for probability zero, uh, you will hit the true value asymptotically, which happens with probability zero, because asymptotically is in the limit, you know, and you don't have enough time to go to a limit. Um, but all this theory breaks down when the number of parameters exceed sample size. For example, we have, let's say, 50 million variants, and a sample size is at 1,000, and you want to learn about the state of nature, you can't. You can't. Because the first thing that they teach you in a good course in statistics is that if you have a sample size of size n, you can ask at most n independent questions to the data. If you ask another question, the answer to that question will be a redundant answer because you, the machine can only answer 1,000 questions and not more. However, if you fit these fancy Bayesian models, you are asking 50 million questions and you get 50 million answers. Even irrespective of whether n is equal to two, n is equal to five, or n is equal to 50,000. So when, uh, when p exceeds n, learning is imperfect. And Oscar Kempthorn, whom, whom I was not in his side, and I'm still not in his side, he's deceased now, he wrote, uh, in a review of a very important paper in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, the reporting only based on estimate, each based on the prior of the person who obtained them, will butcher the process of science. So uh, I feel partially responsible uh, from the point of view that I introduce. Uh, I reaffirm Bayesian method. I don't want to be that pretentious. So I need, at this stage of my life, to share my caution about the use of Bayesian method inferentially when p exceeds n. Okay, so that means that you shouldn't base. Well, uh, the problem of the Bayesian approach, if, uh, if you have this uh, n smaller than p problem, the prior is necessarily influential because uh, you are asking more questions than um, than the data allow you to answer, and, uh, but you get an answer because the prior is telling, oh, say this, say that, say that, but it does it in a very subtle way, cryptic way. So you can either go to heaven or you can go to hell, depending on your prior. So um, the more extravagant the prior is, the more likely somebody will get screwed up, okay? Apart let me say something else. Um, uh, here we have already uh, seen reports of uh, good results from an inferential point of view of uh, Bayesian mixtures. The Bayesian mixtures, especially when P is at than N, uh, have very delicate problems and they cannot be used in a cavalier manner. In addition to that, uh, mixtures with, say, 50 million parameters are usually uh, resolved by using some sort of data augmentation where you introduce latent variables. So you end up with joint posterior distributions uh, whose dimension could be easily 200 million. Uh, I've never seen a 200 million dimensional distribution estimated properly, especially with only half a million samples. Okay? So the amount of Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling that you need to do to do serious inference with this highly parameterized, highly dimensional Bayesian model is absolutely enormous. It is feasible. There are all sorts of convergence problems that pop in. And the, the rates of convergence based on variational distance in indicate that probably if you have, let's say, a mixture with uh, two million parameters, that you probably should 
run your MCMC scheme but for a million iteration before you start sampling. And then, and then, of course, you have all the problems that sampling are highly codependent, so you have to do an enormous amount of sampling. Okay, we talk about epistasis. Uh, uh, it can be gene by gene, gene by gene by gene, gene by gene by gene by gene. It's something that we have to accept. Uh, but epistasis does not show up in, uh, in variants. Uh, so what is it? Is it an anomaly? Uh, well, uh, molecular data indicate that there are the so-called epistatic networks, but they do not translate into variants. So the, the variance component of the composition denies epistasis, but epistasis exists. So uh, you probably remember Rousseau from the French Revolution. He has a book called La Nouvelle Eloise, uh, and I adapted a phrase uh, which goes like this. Um, uh, the additive the, the model, the additive genetic model denies what it is and explains what it is not. Okay, but the good news. Oh, sorry, again. Um, so because of this uh, complexity, people have launched into the so-called systems approaches. I call it neo systems approaches because there is nothing new about system approaches except that we have new phenotypes, new things to measure. But, but to understand the system, you not only need connections, you need arrows, and you need rates. Okay? So uh, some people claim that by doing this sort of thing, you will go to the causes of a complex system. Uh, the jury is still out, and I'm, it, it's quite unlikely. This, this is a temporary fad. I'm not sure it's going to take us very far in the nas of complex trade. And <coughs> unfortunately, the golden rule, which is the randomized experiment, will not help us either, uh, because you cannot do the experiments that are required to understand all the multiple interactions between genetic and environmental factors. So I'm afraid that what we'll be learning will be entirely based on observational data uh, with all the problems observational data pose. But the medical scientists have been able to make progress with observational data. Well, this is a paper that actually showed uh, empirically and analytically why most of the variance that we recover is additive, okay? There is some epistatic variance, but it's actually captured by the additive component. So one, one thing that uh, relates to what Jerry was saying about the cumulative effect of selection, it is, it is cumulative if you keep selecting. If you stop selecting because, let's say, some conservationists tell you, that, oh, you should leave this population at peace, probably it will go down. If you relax selection, most of the experiments indicate that it goes down because there is some epistasis that selection is favoring. And when selection ceases, these uh, favorable combinations uh, are not picked up anymore, so the population goes down. But there are other reasons as well. Okay, um, another way of dealing with scientific matters, even though uh, they will not give you an explanation of the whys, is the predictive approach. This is actually not a new approach, uh, and it goes roughly as follows. You construct a statistical models, a statistical model such as a Bayesian model, but you do not take the parameters seriously, okay? You say, the, your objective is not to infer. Then you use that model as a predictive machine, and you see how it behaves when the model is confronted with new data. If it has a good predictive performance, according to some metric, then you have a good predictive theory. But that predictive machine may not necessarily explain you the, the, the mechanistics unless it's a really simple problem. Okay? So um, this is a, a, an approach and one that we have used in animal breeding very effectively, uh, you know, with pedigree. Yeah, we didn't understand what was going on, but we were able to breed better animals. So this leads us directly into paradigm number three, which is actually a predictive or classificatory paradigm, which is the era of machine learning and artificial intelligence. It's a largely non-parametric because these are based on models where the coefficients do not mean anything. They rarely mean anything. Um, has anybody here read a machine learning book or has a machine learning book? Raise your hand. Okay, not many. 
But if you, if you take, let's say, any recent machine learning book, you will see that there are chapters like uh, pattern recognition, cross-validation, random forest for vector machines, ensemble methods, uh, boosting, bagging, non-parametric based on net, sampling method, kernel set, universal approximators, et cetera. So it is a lot of hype about it, but I think uh, it will be good to remind you that uh, animal breeders and plant breeders have been using this. Uh, sampling, for example, uh, cross-validation. The first cross-validation that I've been able to discover is a paper in theoretical and applied genetics in plants by Utz, Utz uh, Schön and Melchinger from Germany. Um, kernel methods were introduced in quantitative genetics in 2006. We have a paper with Alessandra Stella and Rohan Fernando. Um, Bayesian nets, 2009. Non-parametric prediction, 2006. Uh, boosting, Oscar Gonzalez Recio. Uh, random forest, Oscar Gonzalez Recio. Support vector machines, Nan Ye Long. Uh, and Blab. BLAP is a universal approximator because it's a linear neural network and identity activation function. So we have been doing machine learning even though we have called it so. Okay? So if you, if you, just, if you do BLAP, just say I'm doing machine learning and you, you'll be received with applause. <laughs> One of my favorite machine learning methods is reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces regression, uh, which is based on the idea of Choosing a good function in a Hilbert space of function is a very rich, uh, uh, it is a, a very difficult problem mathematically. It was solved in 1971 uh, by Grace Waba. She was a PhD student in Stanford. And this is a photo of Professor Hilbert. I have no idea why the Republic of Congo uh, gave him a stamp, uh, but he was a very important mathematician. He was in Göttingen, actually. So uh, we use these with chickens, uh, and then uh, has not received a great deal of attention, except in plants. And uh, it has been found out that whenever you accommodate G by E interaction with kernel methods, you get much better prediction. Actually, the CIMIT people are, are quite fond of, uh, of these. Um, recently, a paper by um, Tietzi, Gustavo de los Campos, uh, Parker Gaddis, and Chris Malteca. These two guys are from North Carolina, and they are Italian, so you have to be careful with the results. Um, they, uh, they fitted the uh, G by interaction using a reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces model, and they look at prediction performance in new bulls and bulls with incomplete prediction tests. And in some cases, they got what we may wish to call a significant uh, in increase in predictability from a cross-validatory perspective. So uh, yes, G by E can be an important component of a prediction machine, even in dairy cattle. Um, now, in, in, in human, uh, uh, there, are, there are two worlds. The human world, they have a hell of a lot of money. And for some reason, the Arabidopsis world. You know, Arabidopsis is an irrelevant plant, but there is an enormous amount of resources in Arabidopsis. And um, there have been uh, what are called polyomic uh, predictions. So they call it Omin Creek. This is from the University of Chicago, where they analyze uh, respiratory disease. This is the first paper in which the, there was a combination of genomic data, expression data, and metabolic data, and they used kernels and they got better predictions. And this uh, is a paper uh, using epigenomics in which we, there, there were 740,000 probes to predict 121 Arabidopsis lines. There is no theory whatsoever because uh, from the little I know about epigenetics that your epigenome changes as you talk. Okay? Everything is changed. So it's like a photo, but this photo seems to have some predictive value. The world continues, you know, on one side we have fine phenotyping, all these sort of things that you can measure with MIR or whatever. It's, it's, you know, we are being fine phenotyped by Google. Anytime you Google, they are collecting things about all your phenotypes in every possible respect. Um, let me motivate the problem by uh, quoting the, I'm sorry, it's a uh, five, 
6.30, but I start a bit later. It will take me a few more minutes. Uh, this is uh, uh, Dan Brown, the author of the famous Da Vinci Code and Angel and Demons. These were taken to Hollywood with uh, um, was Tom Hanks. Uh, his most recent book is based on a plot to kill the king of Spain. And it starts in the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. And the central character in the, in the book is not uh, the Harvard professor nor the woman uh, that accompanies the professor, but it's actually a computer called Winston. And Winston uses deep learning, okay? So this is the hype. And uh, it's actually the return of the neural networks. The neural networks have been around since 1943, and they have periods of feast and famine. And almost invariably, no matter how you fit a neural network, if you use penalized maximum likelihood or uh, early stopping or whatever, you are going to encounter a problem where the neural network will overfit and will predict zilch. Okay. Well, they, these are new networks that uh, are based on multiple layers and also on some sort of clever algorithm that kill other networks to avoid overfitting. So in the last, uh, well, before I, 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 I go to the punchline, uh, we had some transits with neural networks. We actually constructed one that we call the polyperceptron. Uh, if you take this thing here that's called the perception, and we added another group of neurons to code for dominant SNPs that uh, adds a second perception, so we call this the polyperception. And in a little paper published in the Journal of Animal Science, uh, Paulino Perez, he's from Mexico, um, he found that if you run a neural network with Markov chain Monte Carlo, you get much better results than if you use any of these optimization techniques that have been suggested. But of course, uh, before you converge, you'll probably die, okay? If you put 50 million inputs in a neural network and you do MCMC, you, you, you'll probably die. But going back to deep learning, um, this is the idea that uh, from a single, a sim simple neural network, is something that goes like this. You have inputs, let's say SNPs or variants. You have uh, neurons, a middle layer that they do transformation, they collect inputs and then they emit. And then you have uh, output balls. For example, if you have a four, you have a tumor that has four modalities, depending on which of these balls is bigger, you will classify the tumor into benign or mildly cancerous or, or whatever. And the, and the deep learners are just neural networks have several layers. So by virtue of having several layers, you introduce a hell of a lot of parameters, so you need clever algorithms. So let me go back about a year ago. We had a World Congress of Genetics Applied to Livestock Production. I think you were there, Bento, and many of you were there. The, normally, these uh, congresses have plenary, play, uh, plenary speakers. And one of the plenary speakers is a very famous guy from uh, Australia or New Zealand that uh, has a company that does deep learning. And uh, he appears in Australian TV for breakfast. And you know he tells you how to buy a $25 iron using a deep learner, something like that. And he came and said that the animal breeding methods are obsolete, that we should do deep learning, et cetera, in the absence of any evidence whatsoever. Okay? I barked a little bit, but the chairman interrupted me, so I, I couldn't make my point. Let's see what we know about deep learning so far in terms of genome-enabled prediction in agriculture. This paper, I'm sure you haven't read it because it was published in the Journal of Physics. Uh, it was done by a group in Indonesia uh, working with plant breeding data. It's a curious combination of things. Maybe it was turned down, it was turned down in a plant breeding page journal and was sent to the Journal of Computational Physics. So they compared several traits in maize uh, in different environmental conditions. Uh, this doesn't matter too much. And they uh, contrasted the predictability of a deep learner, this is called a deep belief network, with our good old friend GBLAP, based in Lasso, reproducing Colonel Hilbert's basis regression. There are eight comparisons. 
And only in two comparisons, the deep belief networks did well, better than the other ones, but observe that in four of the eight comparisons, they were a total disaster. I don't know what problems there were with blood, but if you, for example, compare these numbers with the Bayesian lasso and with reproducing kernel Hebert spaces regression, that is not a very convincing piece of evidence that supports the use of deep learning. Anyhow, it was done in Indonesia, so you know, who cares? Um, no convincing superiority. Then um, there is a, a, a deluge of papers uh, by the group of Jose Crosa in CIMIT, uh, in which I, I am involved because I had the bad idea of telling these guys three years ago they should look into deep learning. Um, so here there are several, this is a meta result. There are nine data sets, including wheat in Iran. So the blue is GBLAB, the red is deep learning. These are models in which interaction variables were fit in the model. That's when you would expect the deep learners to do better. Well, look what happened. Eight times GBLAB was better, and only one out of nine, the deep learning was better. When interaction was removed from the model, the opposite happened. The deep learner was better six out of nine times. Uh, but I, I would suspect that most of these results are just root to random variation because as, as Jerry pointed out with his two cross-validation schemes, uh, you have to replicate your prediction exercise to get a realistic measure of prediction uncertainty. If you do it only once, then you will claim that epistasis has to be inserted in the model, that dominance has to be inserted in the model, that this has to be removed in the model. But if you do it many times, you will see that the confidence bands are huge. And the outcome, a good prediction machine has to consider two aspects. One is that the training set has to be large in some sense, but also the testing set has to be large, because if the testing set is small, the prediction uncertainty is huge. Okay? So cross-validation is absolutely crucial. Then uh, they did the same, uh, but now the, instead of using BLAP, they use a Bayesian multi-trait. It's like a BLAP multi-trait model done from a Bayesian perspective. And they also use a deep learner multi-trait. The white is the deep learner. You know, nothing, nothing to go to war there. Okay, so the, the classical method do better or about the same. Now we move into humans. This is a paper by um, Paul Belo and Perez Enciso from Barcelona, and Gustavo Los Campos from Michigan State. They look at human stature. They fed half a million SNPs into a base B model, which is the gray. Um, the black is a Bayesian blob. The greens are multi-layer neural networks, and the magenta, pink ones, are state-of-the-art deep learners. Uh, I think it should be clear to us that deep learners did not do better than GBLAB, okay? Now, they look at another trait, bone hill mineral density, and look at the deep learners. In this case, they did more or less similarly to base B and G blob, but in some cases, the performance was disastrous, which is consistent with what we know about neural networks. The neural networks are so greedy that they tend to overfit, and when this happens, the predictive ability is, is very poor. Okay, so we have covered a lot of ground in about 100 years since Fisher's 1918 paper, since Galton's regression. We have had a lot of transit. Um, we are now in this situation still searching for QTL, still doing GWAS, whole genome prediction, machine learning networks, trying to find causal variants, new system approaches, deep learning, the works, etc. So, my conclusion from this cursory review of statistics in animal and plant breeding, and I, I would like to include plant breeders here too, because now we, we, we married again, as uh, John Hickey was saying this morning. Uh, animal breeders have taken up statistical ideas fairly rapidly. They have also contributed to statistics. 
uh, from an applied perspective. It's important to keep in mind that inference and prediction are connected, but are not the same thing. A method can be very good for prediction, very poor for explanation. A model can be very good for explanation, very good for, bad for prediction. Um, more conclusions. Uh, I predict that many GWAS will be rewashed away uh, when repeated. Um, the kernel-based method Neo systems approach as well, they are done with flies, and, and the pigs do not fly. Uh, Arabidopsis is not a crop. Uh, the worms, this kind of orbitis, is another model organism, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you can extrapolate to snakes, who knows. Um, there are challenges to, to methodology posed by this deluge of information. I just hope that we do not get lost in this, uh, you know, universal deluge of fine phenotyping, as they call it. It's, it's, uh, it's a bit like um, these uh, tourist buses that uh, you, uh, you have these tourists coming from a bus and they, and they go to Venice and they spend all the time taking photo, 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 and they go back and they, you know, they have done fine phenotyping but they miss, you know, the Piazza San Marcos or Santa Lucia di la Salute or La Biennale or something like that. So we, we, we can get lost in the, in the deluge. Um, Next uh, comes uh, metagenomics. Uh, uh, Reinhardt told us a little bit about it. But then, of course, once we have metagenomics, we'll get into a genetic metagenomics, like with the EQTLs. Now we're going to look at for QTLs for the metagenome, and the story will repeat itself. Uh, will the future uh, change analytically? I don't think so in animal and plant breeding. I think we have pretty good methods. GBLAP is a good method. Uh, some of these Bayesian mixture models are very good for prediction. They are better when you have small effect variants. Uh, they are very good at picking up large effect variants, but very poor at picking up small effect variants because the mixture prior flattens all the small effects and exacerbates all the large effects. It's a bit like the tax cuts. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Okay, uh, so I think quantitative genetics theory is a very simplistic, but will continue guiding our action, and I think it should. Uh, I claim that the mystery of the QTLs for complex trade will continue for a long time, uh, because we are asking extremely difficult questions, uh, which uh, are not easy to, to answer, and I don't have any, any good suggestion. But I do have a new project for Allison, um, CNN, you probably read this, uh, uh, they have implanted uh, genes into monkeys' brain, and the interesting thing, uh, these monkeys are pretty good at cognitive stuff, you know, so uh, that's your next challenge. Very good. Thank you very much to all. Before I invite you to go to, go to the stage, uh, the answer to your question, if I used Harvard, uh, oh, uh, Harvey's programs, yes, I did, both in, in master's and PhD. <laughs> that was the only research we had. Um, it's always very good to, to discuss science. There is no, no uh, right answer for, for any question, but to, to see this kind of of, of reasoning is always very stimulated. Let's discuss a little bit more in, in our run, run table. Round table. Yeah, come, come here, guys. I am a, a, a very happy and I'm very sad. I'm happy because I guess we invited the best speakers we could for this workshop. Uh, have a lot of opinions, a lot of knowledge, uh, 
a lot of, uh, we have to think about the statistics, statistics basis of everything. But I'm sad that uh, the more uh, I live and study, the less I know. So, I don't know, it's sometimes it's time to stop and, okay, let's stay here. Opens, open question. I have one question. Uh, I saw that uh, in, in Daily Cattle, you start doing genomic selection after a million or two millions or three million genotypes. Uh, we saw here some things yesterday of few samples uh, analyzed to metagenomics and taking some conclusions. And I'm afraid, uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, the American Angus Association start talking about single step selection after 400,000 uh, genotypes. We in Brazil are starting to work, to talk about uh, genomic selection in, in LOR with maybe five or less than 10,000 genotypes. How risky is that? Um, maybe I will comment. We, we have three million genotypes in the database. The predictor population is, is much smaller. So we're not, we're not using three million genotypes to construct the prediction equations. I think, I think the, uh, the prediction population is um, more on the order of 90,000 animals, something like that. So, so, so that number is a little bit deceiving. You know, it, it maybe implies that something is happening that's not happening. And you, you, your question about 5,000, we started with 1,500. I, I think a lot of it will depend on do you have DNA available for key animals in the population, like say older bulls, that you have high reliability breeding values for? We had that resource available, which helped us get started maybe with fewer genotypes in the predictor population than you might need if you, uh, if you don't have that. Any, any further questions? Comments? Okay. John? Uh, so, Daniel, yesterday you challenged us as a group to reflect on our choices uh, in areas of research that we might invest in, and you know, should we pursue certain technologies. And today you have given a very interesting history of the use of statistics in animal breeding. But if we reflect on that, what has the true added value of of the investment the community has made in statistics been? Do you think we have completely over-invested in statistics? For example, BLUP, what did it really add over, over and above what a progeny test would give? Uh, uh, John, I, I ran out of battery. My, uh, can you uh, repeat the, the question close to me? Yeah, are you, let's see if I understood correctly. You're asking what is the added value of spending so much effort in novel statistical methods? Or uh, the, the answer is I, I do not know because I've never seen an internal rate of return for that in the same way that I've never seen an internal rate of return for genomic selection in the same way that I have not seen an internal rate of return for metagenomics. Uh, all, all I can say is that giving the data is something that is extraordinarily cheap, except, of course, for the intellectual effort that one spends in thinking about new methods. Um, I think there has been progress, undoubtedly. How much that has contributed to genetic improvement is another matter. And, and we, we, I think if we look at into genomic selection, most of the gain doesn't come necessarily from better, more accurate, as they say, predictions, but because it changes the strategy of the business, like you were suggesting some new visionary ways, and that's, at the end, is probably much more important. Uh, I, I think if we, it, it will be an interesting question to, to ask, uh, what is the rate of return of so much uh, 
research in molecular genetics in animal plant breeding relative to the rate of return of research in other areas? And the answer is I do not know. The only study of such sort that I saw is that there was a paper many years ago written by Simit, by economists that analyzed the question that Simit was addressing into going to molecular breeding versus conventional breeding, and they actually computed rates of return, and they found out that uh, molecular breeding will be highly, uh, it will have a very high uh, rate of return in the hands of large corporations, and I think that's exactly what happened. Roberto. My question is for Jose. Uh, you gave us a very nice ex successful example of uh, fish breeding program in, in Chile from an uh, exotic species, from a uh, non-native species. What do you think we should do in Brazil to, to get a better position? Should we go for improving tilapia here, or do you think we have a huge potential in exploring native species? If you, if you are going to work here in Brazil, what would be your, your target for a better position? Yeah, I think... Uh um, in some industries, uh, highly required by, by by the by the producers, so it's something that, that that came from producers from the industry and not from from the academy, from 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 people at the universities. So I think uh, it's uh, it's highly required to to listen to the producers and uh, or to 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 take a look at what is happening at the at, at the industry. And tilapia is growing very fast uh, worldwide and here in Brazil as well. And uh, I think the cost of implementing a breeding program is, is relatively high. Uh, and if you want to include the genomic selection, it's even higher. So uh, you need to dilute the cost of, uh, of maintaining the breeding program and also genotyping animals. So I think... Uh, big producers of, or, or producers with uh, high volumes of, of, of fish will be able to, to implement uh, breeding programs. I don't think uh, small producers uh, will be able to do it, but there are alternatives, alternatives for them, uh, like Coop, uh, uh, how, how do you say in English, cooperativas. Cooperativas can be a solution for them, but uh, we know that uh, it's not easy to to get all pro uh, small producers uh, to get uh, to work together, so there is a challenge there. And uh, if, if you ask, if you ask me, I, I see a lot of a lot of uh, potential in tilapia aquaculture, and they they're, they're going to need uh, uh, breeding programs here to to increase production. John, um, with your, the addition of feed intake to your index, what major trait complexes are left to be added to the index to make it complete? Um, oh, well, um, j j just getting to the point of having feed index in the index is going to be complicated because when we put it in, in some very preliminary internal calculations, I think it ended up accounting for something like 14% of the, the weight in, in the index. So uh, some of my industry is not going to be happy with a trait with low reliability taking up that much emphasis, but that's how valuable feed is, I suppose. Um, but to your, your question, um, Uh, I, I suppose, for, for probably from our point of view, one thing that might be missing would be actually better information on milk composition, whether it's, it's, it's specific fatty acids or specific casein uh, variants. Now, at this point, even if we had the data, we probably wouldn't put it in the index because it's not paid, there's not a premium paid to the farmer for it. 
So we, we don't generally put it in the index until the farmer can actually realize that income. But, um, you know, and you're maybe asking, do I think there are any really substantial gaps, something that we've just completely missed? Uh, I would say no. Um, but I do also think that there's an opportunity to have much better fertility phenotypes because most of our fertility phenotypes are based on days open um, and then we also have age at first calving but days open is a measure even if you break it up into four or five different interval traits isn't really a very good model of the underlying fertility in the cow but as uh, as Affy and Laley and some of these companies work out some of the kinks on their say their real-time progesterone modules for the automated milking systems, there's the potential that we could actually get much better direct measures of fertility. Because I, I, I don't think our current phenotypes are very good, but they're what we can afford to measure. Any further questions, Coachinho? I, I think, uh, Jerry, you, you, you showed a very good lesson on your experiment because you said you, at first you said you had a good way to measure the phenotype, right? And then you found out that really wasn't that good because it was a complex phenotype. I think the problem when we go to more advanced camera and, and automatic sampling and, and phenotyping we're, we're turning a problem bigger because those are, I mean, th those that ev even if you're looking for something simple like a hormone level, there are many genes involved. But then you go to reproduction, which there are many, many other things involved. So I think we need to be, start moving away to less complex phenotype so we can reliably measure something. Because, like you said, when you measure a complex phenotype, and you only had two, mainly two uh, pathogens, right? And you had the problem. But if you have something that has four or five pathogens, and this is it's a nightmare. Yeah. So that's why I think that that makes it progress a yeah. lot more difficult. Yeah. For instance, when we did uh, meat quality. Right. Okay. So you measure meat quality, uh, shear force. Well, that's fine. But that's a very complex phenotype because right. you could be tender because you have less, um, less stress in the animal before, because you're a younger animal, because you have more protein turnover or less protein turnover, or have more collagen. So there are many things involved, and that's each one of those have complex, they have many genes, and then the many genes and a complex trait is just a nightmare. Uh, so I think we need to simplify the phenotype. And more yeah. precision. Yeah, I mean, yes, yes and no. I think every phenotype is complex, right? I mean, if you talk about growth, right, or you talk about milk production, I mean, it's not just one process. There's a whole lot of metabolic things going on that underlie that, you know. In terms of growth, you're looking at, at, at um, the efficiency of growth. You're looking at protein turnover and degradation. You're looking at a number of different underlying things. Um, the difference between growth and milk production and fertility is that fertility has a very low her heritability. So you're looking at a very complex phenotype because it takes a lot of things that have to happen in order to get a pregnancy that results in a calf. Um, but the heritability of that process is, is very, very low. And I think that's, that's the fundamental problem. We do fine selecting for growth. We do fine selecting for milk production, which yeah, are but, complex traits but, because the heritabilities are so high. But I, I, might, I may be wrong there, but I think that for some of those traits that we've been selecting before genomics, oh. the favorable alleles are already at a higher allele frequency that you can capture and, and measure the, the effect. When you start looking for something that you never selected before, then you, you have many more alleles that have a low frequency. And then, like you said, you're going to have to have 100,000 animals to measure something. Uh, I'm, because I'm not, allele frequency I'm of the favorable I'm not so sure that so that's small. true. I mean, John showed some data, right? You know, the, the data that they simulated, that if you had 10,000 QTNs, 
and then you started selecting what's the average change in allele frequency when you're distributing your selection pressure across 10,000 loci. On average, they don't change very much. Your allele frequency doesn't change very much. So I think the allele frequency spectrum for an unselected trait versus a selected trait probably doesn't change very much if there are a large number of loci that have relatively small effects. The things that have large effects really change, really change fast. And, you know, we published a paper in Angus in 2012 that said if you look over a 50-year period of time in that population and you genotype the SNP50 in that population, do you detect evidence that the genome is under selection? And we estimated in that, in that paper um, I think that 72% of the genome as a whole was being exposed to very strong selection and changing in allele frequencies. So, so the, the next step to that is to say that linkage drag, even though you may have 10,000 QTNs distributed throughout the, the genome, or even 1,000 QTNs, linkage drag is going to cause the whole genome to change. So even if it's a non-selected trait, the, allele, the alleles are, frequencies are going to change at that low locus as a function of whatever the ge genetic correlations are between that trait and the selected trait. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that that's true, no, but I'm, I agree I'm, with you in I'm, terms I'm of... As, as we start moving into new traits that we never selected before, I mean, the, the, maybe the allele, one animal is a little better because one allele is more free, like you're saying, the, the deleterious ones. You know, it's a testable hypothesis. Yeah. We could simulate that, right, John? Yeah. Well, but I, I mean, I, you can simulate some things, Jerry, but if you, like if you talk, say, to Tamila Wiltbank and some of the physiologists, what they'll tell you is they, they have, at least in subfertile dairy cows, they have data that show that one of the things that's happening is as you've selected for increased production, you've dramatically increased the rate of blood flow through the liver, right, through the pornal venous shunt. And one of the things that happens in many subfertile animals is the hormone signal from the, 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 the hypothalamus is actually being broken down in the liver, and what's actually reaching the, the, the reproductive tract is a much lower level of signal than, than was originally sent by the, by the brain. So I do agree with you that with with certain really complex systems where you have lots of things going on at once, it, it can be difficult. And, you know, when I say something like maybe if we have progesterone, we get better, I don't think the heritability of fertility is going to go to 50 percent. You know, but I think if it goes to 12 percent potentially, at least for certain things, that would be uh, of benefit because I worry that what we're measuring now is. Uh, you know, particularly with epistasis, there are lots of other things that affect it. And I don't know if we're really doing a good job of measuring fertility. Although, Dan, this was a long time ago when I was a, <clears throat> a master's student and you came to LSU when Rob Templeman was there. I think that maybe you commented that the, that the heritability of fertility was one. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> well, I think your point was simply an animal reproduces or it does not. <laughs> I think was maybe a, a, what the thinking was. So I, I certainly don't think, Louise, to your point, that we're going to find one perfect thing and we measure it and all of a sudden everything is easy. I, I don't believe that at all. And, for, and fertility may be one of the most complex things we're trying to improve in the cow, so we may never have a great uh, predictor of it. Mostly I have the feeling that what we're currently using to, to measure fertility is not very good. And I just, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe we can find something a little better. I mean, I would take going from 4% to 6% at this point, because in the long term, we, we could see a large benefit from that. Hi, Roberto. Jerry, I was curious. I don't know if it's related or not, but I was curious to know about this six or seven percent of contexts that didn't align to the reference for, for the same animal. Do you think that methylation can explain a little bit of that or no? Oh, so 
physically what we did in that experiment. So, um, you know, we have a reference assembly for dominant decay. Um, it was based on sort of hybrid sequences. It was generated using a Illumina sequence and about a 6x coverage of the genome that was produced um, at Baylor College of Medicine using Sanger sequences, Sanger sequencing. So we had a reference assembly. Um, and then after that had been assembled, so the, the University of Maryland and Alexei Zimmern at the University of Maryland built that assembly, that hybrid assembly. And then we came back and took more DNA from the same cow and the DNA came either from the blood of the cow or from a liver sample from the cow. We extracted the nucleic acids, the DNA from that. We made libraries, we sequenced them. They were not used to create the assembly. And then we aligned them. Now, they ought to align perfectly, right? Other than the fact that you're going to get some sequencing errors. So the Illumina technology has about a 1% error rate to it. So you should not get more than one mismatch So in, in a read on average. So if you allow two mismatches um, in both pairs, so you've got two by 100s, so if you, allow, if you reject an alignment, it's going to require two errors in that read and two errors in that read, and that is a, an appreciable number. Um, but that's not what was going on. So we said, okay, maybe this is because of errors in the technology, that the sequences that we actually have, we filtered them when we align to the reference. Everything that's good aligns nicely, that has very low errors in it aligns nicely, and the, the stuff that's left over could be the stuff that, that had higher error rates in the sequencing, but that's not true. What, what's there in the DNA and also RNA-seq, so we took tissues from the same animal. When that animal died, um, they took, the USDA guys took about, I don't think, 100 or more different tissues from that animal and um, did RNA-seq experiments using those tissues because they wanted to use that data to help annotate the sequence assembly. In other words, go in and say, okay, where are the blo blocks that get transcribed off of, off of the sequence? So where are the codon blocks associated with each of the genes to help identify where each gene was how many codons it had and the like. Um, and so we got access to those data because Chris Elzik at the University of Missouri was doing that work, the, the annotation work, and we were doing some alignment with it and we find the same problem. We find that about 6% of the reads just don't align and so we ask, is that a reflection of error rate? And so we took those reads that didn't align and put them through an assembler Trinity, I think, was one of the assemblers that we used, and saw whether or not we could build contigs. In other words, did these things, you know, actually come from someplace else and not have high error rates in them, which would then allow us to build very small contigs because there's not a lot of sequence there, and it's, you know, and it's not, um, it's only two by 100 reads. Um, and we built those contigs, and then we took the biggest ones, the largest of those contigs, and we just threw it against the non-redundant database. So that's where everybody for the last, you know, 40 years has been depositing their sequence data. So, you, you know, in 1976, somebody's doing some, some sequencing, um, you know, using gel, gel, agarose gels, and they sequence an individual gene out of cow, and they get their sequence, and they put it in that database. So it's independent of the reference assembly. It's just all the sequences that people have generated from all kinds of species put in that database. And then we aligned our sequences that we'd built into, so instead of just the reads themselves, we tried to put them together into larger contigs, and then we aligned them across that, that non-redundant uh, database and said, what comes back? What do we find? What has high homology in that database? And then you get all of the returns, and then you take the one that has the, the highest hit in other words, the greatest homology over the la largest number of bases, you take that one and say, I'm going to take that as being, being my hit, and you say, what do you find? And so what we find is um, a lot of vertebrate sequence, a lot of Bostaurus sequence that, that was present in there, and we say, well, why do we find 
Bostora sequence in the non-redundant database that's also in the sequences we're analyzing, but it's not in the reference assembly. And, and the answer is, it's not in the reference assembly, right? So when they built the reference assembly, there are large chunks missing. And we know there are large chunk missing, and a lot of them are in um, um, the five prime end of genes. First exons uh, were missing in a large number of genes within that assembly. We actually found, I think, um, I don't remember the number, but we found a significant number of genes that were just totally missing for the reference assembly. There was no gene in the reference assembly. We know it's in bovine, but it's not in the, in the reference assembly. So what it was really reflecting was limitations in the ability to build a reference assembly using Illumina data and a little bit of, of um, Sanger data that was, for the most part, fixed when we went to the PacBio assembly. So using much longer reads, very large depth of coverage, you know, 70x depth of coverage of reads that average 10 KB. You know, when we went to a completely new sequencing technology and built a reference assembly using those reads, we got much more of the true genome represented within that reference assembly. So that was one part of it. But the other part of it is you find these weird things. You find worms. You find DNA sequence from worms. You find, you find sequence in the, in the RNA data. You find sequence for RNA viruses. So when you take RNA out of a tissue, you take all of the RNA that's present within that tissue. So if there's a worm in that tissue and you grind it up when you're doing your extraction, or probably not worms, you'd see them, but eggs. Eggs from these worms are actually within the tissue. They're so small that when you freeze that tissue and you get the mortar and pestle and the homogenizer and grind it all up, you don't see them. But you're extracting the RNA or possibly the DNA, depending upon what, what extraction you're doing, from everything. So it's, what I'm saying is it's, it's a metagenomic analysis. You don't think it's a metagenomic analysis. You think I'm extracting DNA from dominate from liver from dominate. The answer is yes, you are. But you're also extracting DNA from anything else that might be within that liver sample. And if that includes worm eggs, you're extracting DNA from those worm eggs. So then when you do the analysis that we did, it came back and lined it against the non-redundant database, it says, what out there looks like this piece of sequence? And you find something like um, G. pulchrum. You, you pull a, a worm back, a worm species back, and, and it says, oh, okay, there's a worm here, but I know that this particular worm doesn't live in North America. It's not here, it's not been sequenced in North America. Well, there's a whole family of worms that exist within that, that genus, right? So there's a, we've got a genus for monkeys, and, and you've got a whole bunch of different monkey species. We've got a genus for worms. So there's a whole bunch of worm species that live within that genus. This one's been sequenced. It lives in Africa. But there are others that may be living in other parts of the world, like Brazil or Montana. And in this case, we're finding the ones in Montana but these have never been sequenced before. They may not even be known to, to exist there. And what you find is the nearest member of the species that has been sequenced in the non-redundant database. So it's a metagenomic analysis. You don't realize it's a metagenomic analysis until you get those unmapped reads and you take the unmapped reads and go back and query them against all sequences that exist and try to find homology and find out what they actually come from. So one of the things we were really worried about when we did this was how much of this is just due to um, sloppy technicians when they load flow cells, right? So you know when you, when you lo load an alo aluminum machine, you have multiple lanes on, on the flow cell, and what is the opportunity that you could get cross-contamination? between those lanes, right? So in one lane, somebody's sequencing wheat, and in the next lane, we're sequencing cow DNA. Well, then we might, if there was cross-contamination, we would find wheat DNA, 
you know, in the sequence for our cow sequences. We didn't find that. And, and we actually were able to go back and, and look at the flow cell information to see what else was being sequenced. And nobody was sequencing worms on the same flow cells that we were sequencing um, these particular tissues. So it's pretty clear that what you're doing is, is a metagenomic analysis. You don't realize it, but you have exquisite resolution because you generate hundreds of millions of sequence reads against that nucleic acid sample. And even if you have only four or 500 reads in there that came from a worm species, you'll find it. Okay, I guess we are over the Mickey Mouse uh, threshold now. And I, I have to acknowledge a lot of people. First, the higher administration of the university for funding this workshop. Uh, second, the, 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 the sponsors that helped us to make the coffee breaks and the lunches and the barbecue and everything. Third, <clears throat> It would not be possible to make this event without the very strong help of the people that is with this kind of uh, shirt. Elisangela, Mirelli, Alessandra, Barbara, uh, Rafael, Juliano. Uh, thank you, you did a very good job. And that's, uh, that's, that's more than, yeah. <clears throat> Of course, uh, we have to thank all the speakers. We had a great opportunity to listen to different approaches and views from, from food production. And all of this knowledge is going to change our lives and our ways uh, of, of looking to that problem. Thank you very much for all of you. And this uh, event also would not, be, would not happen without the help of Professor Coutinho, that helped a lot with the, 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 the ESALC, the Agronomy School uh, Administration. Professor Flavio Meirelles, thank you very much. And that uh, workshop would never happen without the hard work of AG. Uh, I, no, I gave up several times. Uh, you, you insisted. Yeah, yeah. You did a great job. We, I guess we, we, we are very, we must be very happy and very glad to all what we have here. Thank you for the audience, for the guys that helped us with the transmission to internet. And it, it was a great experience. Thank you for everybody for coming. Thank you. I'm ready for a beer.